a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. A service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. It's time for My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. Hello, everybody. Yes, it's the new Gay Family series starring Lucille Ball with Richard Dunning, brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O that the yolk of puddings, yes, sir. And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning as Liz and George Cooper, two people who live together and like it. As we look in on the Coopers, it's morning, and there are seven shopping days left until Christmas. George is eating breakfast, and Liz is in the kitchen with Katie, the maid. Katie. Yes, Mrs. Cooper. Have you any idea what George is going to give me for Christmas? Has he said anything? Not a thing. Oh, darn. I've got to find out. Why? Well, I'm knitting him a sweater, and and if he's giving me something wonderful, maybe a measly sweater isn't enough to give him. Oh. On the other hand, if, if he's giving me some dinky little thing... Why should I knock myself out knitting him a beautiful sweater? (laughs) Hi, Mrs. Cooper. Oh, Katie, you don't think I'm serious. It's the thought behind the gift that counts. It doesn't make any difference to me what kind of a fur coat George gives me. (laughs) Well, I wish I could help you. Don't worry. I'll find out before he leaves that breakfast table. Here, give me the coffee. I'll take it in. Ooh, jingle bells, jingle bells, dee dee dee. Good morning, dear. Good morning, Katie. What? Oh, oh, I was reading. Uh, good morning, Liz, darling. Mm, how's my little husband this morning? Hmm? Uh, fine, thanks. Well, is there anything I can do for my sweet little ever-loving baby boy? Yes. Hmm? What? Stop trying to find out what I'm giving you for Christmas. <laughs> oh, you. Come on, George. Iris knows what she's getting. Miss Atterbury's giving her a mink stole for Christmas. How does she know? She already picked it out and charged it to him. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty good clue. Are you buying me a mink stole? Mm, If I bought you a mink, it would have to be sole. (laughs) I made a funny. But it wasn't very. Oh, Oh, well, if you won't tell me what I'm getting, at least you could tell him, sort of give me a hint. Oh, all right. It's, uh, it's big. Yes. And it's small. Huh? It also has long, shaggy hair and three wheels, takes out ink spots, and runs eight days without winding. That's what your mother gave us last Christmas. It is not. <laughs> Say, we never did find out what that was uh, for, did you, did we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, George. Tell me what I'm getting. Uh, Well, I'll tell you this much, though. I bought it, and it's in the hall closet, and I want you to stay out of there, understand? Understand. All right. Now, kiss me goodbye, honey. I'm late for the bank. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. Now, hurry down to the bank. What bank? Uh Uh-oh. I gave him too many volts for this early in the morning. (laughs) Goodbye, dear. Bye. Mrs. Cooper. Mrs. Cooper. Why are you standing there staring at the hall closet? George told me my present was in the hall closet and then made me promise to leave it alone. Only a man could think of a mean thing like that. What are you going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. And then what? 
Katie, you won't find me stooping to snooping. I'm sure I won't. Of course, if there happened to be something in there I needed, I'd have to look in the closet, wouldn't I? Huh? Yes, ma'am. What's in there that I might need? Well, there's your uh, umbrella, but the sun is shining. Oh, how do you like that, Katie? Suddenly it looks like rain. Mm -hmm. It has seemed to cloud up a little, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's my umbrella in back of this big Christmas box. Ooh, look, there's a little tear in the paper. Where? There. (laughs) Oh, clumsy me. Well, now it's open. I guess there's no use turning back. Oh, I'm so excited, Katie. I'll bet it's a dress I was hinting about from Miller's department store. (gasps) It's empty. There's nothing in this box. Oh, yes, there is. At the bottom. It's a car. Oh, oh, yeah. Let's see what it says. Well, I like that. What's it say? It says, I thought I told you to stay out of here, nosy. (laughs) Well, that settles it. He's going to get a sweater and like it. Knit two, pearl one, knit two. Oops! I dropped a stitch. Oh, dear. Well, I can save it if I just put my needle through this loop. Oops! There goes another. Oh, I guess I should have pulled this through. Oops! Oh, well, I was going to do that row over anyway. Darn it, this is slow work. Are you having trouble, Mrs. Cooper? Oh, I'm having an awful time with this sweater I'm knitting for George. Is that a sweater? Well, what does it look like? That's a very good question. (laughs) Oh, I know it's a mess, Katie, and I can't understand it. I followed the directions exactly. Let's see. What's this thing sticking up here? Looks like a sock. It is. It is? Yes. The direction said, purl three inches and then knit a foot. Mrs. Cooper, it didn't mean that. I thought it seemed odd. I I thought maybe I was knitting socks to match the sweater and I could cut them loose later. (laughs) I see. Well, the rest of it is... Wait a minute, what's this hole for? That's the neck. Oh. Then what's this hole next to it for? (laughs) Oh, how do you like that? I left two openings for his head. (laughs) Mrs. Cooper, you'd better rip it out and start over. No, it's a shame to waste all that work. I ought to give it to someone. Do you know anyone with two heads, Katie? (laughs) Not offhand. Oh, wait, I know. I'll knit a belt on the other end of it, and he can use it for pants. (laughs) No? No. I'm not good for anything. I wish I could knit like George's mother can. She doesn't even look at it, and it comes out just perfectly. Oh, that reminds me, Mrs. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Cooper's mother called before and said she was coming over this morning. Oh, Keen. I wonder what Nosy Rosie wants. (laughs) She didn't say. Maybe she's just coming over to visit. Ha! Mother Cooper never comes over just to visit. She comes over to see what I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, what I'm not doing that I should be doing, what I'm doing that if she were doing it, she'd do it a lot better. (laughs) Oh, Mrs. Cooper isn't that bad. Let's face it, Katie. She only lives to see how badly I keep house. An unmade bed is like a transfusion to her. Gives her strength to run her finger along a table and see if there's any dust on it. Well, she won't find any dust in this house. Oh, you dreamer. No, you can't win, Katie. Sometimes I think she's got dirt tattooed on the end of her finger. (laughs) Why did she ever move to town? I don't know. But brooding about it isn't going to get this sweater finished. I guess I'll have to rip most of it out. You'll never finish it by Christmas. Well, George will understand. I'll give him him what I have done and tell him I'll finish it later. Yes, ma'am. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? Thar she blows. <laughs> Mr. Cooper's mother. Who else walks in without ringing the bell? She knows if she rang it, I'd pretend not to be home, the old... Uh, in here, mother. 
<laughs> I'll sneak upstairs, make the beds in case she goes up there. Oh, there you are, Elizabeth. How are you, dear? Fine, Mother Cooper. How are you? Well, here's a sight I never thought I'd see. Elizabeth Cooper dusting. <laughs> I'm not dusting. Oh. Then why are you holding that dirty old dust rag? <laughs> That's a sweater I'm knitting. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dear. I didn't look very closely. Whose dog is it for? <laughs> Yours. <laughs> huh? It happens to be for George. For George? Oh, no! Oh, I could die! Yes, but you won't. <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth. I've hurt your feelings. How could you tell? Uh, come on in, Mother. Pull up a dust ball and sit down. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, I came over to talk to you about something. Yes? You remember you invited me to spend Christmas with you? Well, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. Oh? Aunt Bessie wrote and told me she's going to be all alone for Christmas. So I think I should go there and spend it with her, don't you? Yes. What was the bad news? <laughs> what? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Well, gee, I don't know. It means quite a change in our plan. Oh, well, then I... But uh, anything for dear old Aunt Bessie. <laughs> Yes, the poor soul was wondering if you and George would mind giving me up just this one Christmas. Only one, huh? <laughs> well, I'll force myself. Uh, go to poor old Aunt Bessie. Oh, well, that is all settled. I'll go right home and write Aunt Bessie. Aunt Elizabeth. Yes? If I may make a suggestion, dear, I wouldn't bother finishing that sweater if I were you. Oh, you wouldn't. Oh, now, please, Elizabeth. It's no disgrace not to be able to knit. You have other talents. I have? You must have. <laughs> I mean, uh, some wives can knit, and some wives can cook, and some are beautiful, and some are intelligent, and you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, uh, well, I have to run along, dear. <laughs> Are you driving, or shall I call the Yellow Broomstick Company? <laughs> oh, my Elizabeth, you're so sensitive. Now, if I've said anything, it's just for your own good. My goodness, if I can't make a suggestion, then what am I here for? Oh, you're beginning to wonder, too. <laughs> I'm only trying to help you, dear. I don't want you to be embarrassed. You see, I knitted George a beautiful cashmere sweater. Oh, you did? Yes, and I don't want you to suffer through any comparisons. Well, goodbye, dear. What are you running your finger around the table for? Forget where you parked your gum? <laughs> Would you look at my finger? It's just black with dust. Well, there's only one thing for you to do. Talk to Katie? No, wash your hands. <laughs> That doesn't make your house any cleaner, dear. Oh. <laughs> Goodbye. Don't bother coming to the door. Oh, Katie. What's the matter, Mrs. Cooper? She's knitted George a sweater for Christmas. No. Yes, yeah, so I have to finish mine, and it has to be better than hers. Give me that knitting. Knit one, purl two. Knit one, purl two. Knit one, purl two. Oh, <laughs> It's dollars to a dish of jello that Liz will have a tough time getting out of that spot. But look, here's a holiday treat for your family they sure won't want to exchange. It's Christmassy jellied mincemeat made with rich red cherry jello. Just prepare cherry jello as usual, and when slightly thickened, fold in one cup of moist mincemeat. Chill until firm in individual molds and garnish with rum flavored sweetened whipped cream. Good? Why, it's the zestiest holiday dessert that ever made Christmas merry. Sparkling red cherry jello, luscious with tempting mince meat. All six delicious jello flavors fit right in the holiday mood. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. 
They're rich with locked-in goodness, and they're bright and gay as a Christmas tree. So look for those big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, and Jell-O is a registered trademark of the General Foods Corporation. J-E-L-L-O Back to the Coopers. Liz is still busily working on the sweater that she has vowed to finish for George by Christmas time. Knit one, pearl two. Knit one, pearl two. Knit one, pearl. Mrs. Cooper. One, pearl two. Knit one. Pearl. Are you still up, Mrs. Cooper? It's three o'clock in the morning. What day? Oh, I can't help it, Katie. I have to finish this sweater. How's it coming? I don't know. I haven't been able to see for two hours. It feels all right. Let me take a look. Well, you've licked the neck problem. Only one neck hole. Goody. <laughs> What's this thing? What? Oh, that's the sleeve. Oh. And what's this one? That's the other sleeve. Mrs. Cooper. Yes? What's this one? <laughs> oh, no. Three sleeves. Katie, do you know anybody with three? No. No. Well, here I go again. Liz the Ripper. I'm losing ground, Katie. By Christmas, I'll owe the sweater three balls of yarn. <laughs> Coffee, Mr. Cooper? No, thanks. I'm late now. Uh, tell good, uh, Liz goodbye for me, will you? Oh, here's Sleeping Beauty now. Morning, Mrs. Cooper. Morning, uh, Liz. Hello. Uh, um. Open your eyes, dear. They are open. Well, maybe some food will help you try this. No, thank you. I don't like tomato juice. Well, that's not tomato juice. It's milk. Why is it red? <laughs> It isn't. That's the glow from your eyes. Ooh. Uh, what were you doing last night, Liz? Oh, just working in Santa's sweatshop. Hmm, making something for me? No. Oh, come on, what is it? Well, give me a hint. Now look who wants a hint. All right, I'll give you the same kind you gave me. It's got three arms, two necks, and a foot sticking out of its back. <laughs> You're knitting me a sweater. What? Oh, that was a pretty wild guess, wasn't it? <laughs> Imagine you knitting a sweater. <laughs> Katie, hand me a knife and tell me where he is. Hey, well, I've got to run. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. <laughs> I thought he knew for a minute. Oh, he's so smart. That's just another reason why I have to finish the sweater. Will you get me my knitting, Katie? It's in the hall closet. All right, but I think you should give your eyes a rest. I can't help it. I've got to finish. Mrs. Cooper, did you rewrap that box and put it back here in the closet? No, why? Well, there's another one here. You see. Oh, how do you like that? I didn't even see it. That must be my present. Open it, Katie. Me? Yes, and when George asks me if I open it, I won't be lying when I say no. All oh, the things I do. <gasps> oh, it's from Miller's. I, I hope it... It is, Katie. It's the dress, but it's red. Bright red. Oh, that man. What was he thinking about? I can't wear red with my hair. If I put that dress on, I'd look like an unguentine ad. <laughs> well, you can get it exchanged for another one after Christmas. No, I can't. They only had one green one my size. Katie, I'm going out and exchange it right now. But what will Mr. Cooper say when you open the box on Christmas and the dress is green? Uh, I'll tell him the color ran. So long, Katie. <laughs> One, pearl two, knit one. Pearl. Yes, ma'am, you're there. Uh, just a minute till I finish this rope. Knit one, pearl two, knit one. There. And when you get that sweater finished, are you going to try to exchange it? No. No, I'd like to exchange a Christmas present. 
Jeez, I beg your pardon. I'd like to exchange a Christmas present. Aren't you a little late for last year? It's this year's Christmas present. Oh, well, in that case, oh, what day is this? The 20th. Oh, for a minute, I thought I'd overslept. I uh, just happened to receive this present a little early. Ooh, we've been snoopy, haven't we? Never mind. I'd like to exchange this for a dress that's the right color for my hair. Well, I don't think we have a dress that shade. Now, why don't you take a black one and give it a henna rip? <laughs> oh, I'll bet you're a scream when you get out your chicken inspector badge. Yeah. Will you exchange this dress or not? Well, I'll exchange it on one condition, that you return my telephone cord. Now, what would I be doing with your telephone cord? Well, I don't know, but you've got it knitted into your sweater. Oh! Well, I'm back, Katie. Did they exchange it? Yes, I got the most beautiful Kelly Green dress you've ever seen. Good. I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Liz. I just talked to Mother, and she's leaving a day earlier than she planned. Oh, how wonderful. For Aunt Bessie. I'm going to bring her by the house uh, to pick up her Christmas presents. You'd better have it ready. Okay, where is it? I put it in the hall closet. <laughs> you did what? I put it in the hall closet. It's a big box from Miller's. Miller's? Yeah, yeah. we'll be there in about an hour, honey. Bye. Well, wait a minute, George. Uh... Oh, Katie, I exchanged the wrong present. That dress was for Mother Cooper. No. Yes, and they'll be here in an hour. I'll have to rush down and exchange it again. Wait a minute. Why not let her take the new one? Oh, no, she can't stand green. It clashes with her complexion. I'll see you in an hour, I hope. <laughs> Uh, pardon me. Uh, yes, madam. What can I do for... <laughs> uh, I'd like to exchange something, please. Well, what goody have we poked our nose into this time? Now, look. I'm in a hurry, and I want to exchange this dress. Uh, didn't you just exchange a red dress exactly like this? Yes. I I'd like the red one back in exchange for this green one. Uh, don't tell me. I know. You've rented yourself out as a stop signal. <laughs> Please, I don't have time to explain. Uh, won't it still clash with your hair? No. Oh, I get it. You're going to dye your hair green. No! You're going to shave your head. All right, I'm going to shave my head and paint it green. Now, may I have my exchange slip? It's certainly here. And this. What? Will you bring your head in and let me see it? <laughs> Did you get the red dress back? It's safe in this box. Are they here yet, Katie? Yes. Mr. Cooper and his mother just came in the front door. I told them you were upstairs. Thanks. And, Mrs. Cooper, yeah? I worked on the sweater while you were gone. There's only one row left to do. Oh, Katie. I put it back in the desk drawer. Oh, you're a darling. I better get in there and give Mother Cooper her present. <laughs> Hello, Mother Cooper. Elizabeth. Hi, Liz. Hi, honey. Well, Mother, here's your present. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, uh, wait a minute, Liz. You've made a mistake. I've what? Oh, that's not Mother's present. It isn't? No, that's yours. No, 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 no. Well, it's nothing to get excited about. No? I'll get Mother's present. It's up on the shelf in the closet. What are you looking so glum about, dear? It's Christmas time. Be gay and happy. Jingle bells, jingle bells. Oh, go jingle your own bells. <laughs> How's your sweater coming, dear? Or did you give it up? <laughs> no, I didn't give it up. <laughs> it's right here in the desk drawer. Would you care to see it? Yes. Right here. You... Oh, you bought this. No, I didn't. It isn't even finished yet, see? Your cab is here, Mother. Come on. Uh, coming, baby. Um, Elizabeth, let me see how you finish that neck. Ah, oh, yes. Wonderful. 
Well, let's go. You just have time to get to the station. Here's your present. Oh, thank you both, you dear children. Goodbye. Bye. See you after the holidays. Goodbye, Mother. Oh. What's the matter? Well, there's something cutting my ankle. Huh. It's a piece of yarn. Yarn? Yeah. Look, it goes all the way down the stairs and along the walk and into the cab with Mother. Oh, put your foot on it, George. Break it, quick. Oh, there it broke. I never should have let her near it. I wonder where it comes from. And look, it goes right in the door and along the hall right and... into the living room and across the carpet and up on the desk and all. Liz, you are knitting me a sweater. And isn't it wonderful? You've got two inches finished already. Ah! Yes, Lucille, where to tonight? Come, Robert, we're going back, back, back to the dawn of civilization, the days of the caveman. Of course, no one will understand caveman language, so I will translate. Wilbur, a little prehistoric music. Translation. Get up, Neanderthal. Civilization just dawned. Translation. You don't love me, Neanderthal. You haven't hit me on the head with a club lately. Huh? Oh, sorry. I want Jell-O with its six delicious flavors. Ugly, bugly, babby, oing, boing, and lime. Translation. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and poop. Jell-O make you think of the real ripe ogobug itself. Translation. Fruit. So, look for big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, and Jell-O spells a treat. Oh, oh. Because the... <laughs> because the flavor is locked in and can't get out till your first delectable spoonful. Translation. Yum, yum, yum. Good night, Neander Bob. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Christmas and New Year holiday season is a period of neighborly getting together and renewing community ties. It's a time when every American should be even more aware of the individual liberties he enjoys in the United States. And this freedom demands that each of us fulfills our duties as a, as a citizen. To vote, to serve on juries, and to participate in community, state, and national affairs. By making our form of government work better here, we strengthen democracy everywhere. We provide an example of a free government which preserves the rights and the dignity of the individual. So remember, freedom is everybody's job. You have been listening to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning and based on characters created by Isabel Scott Rory. Tonight's program was produced and directed by Jess Oppenheimer, who wrote the script with Madeline Pugh and Bob Carroll, Jr. Original music was composed by Marlon Skiles and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The part of Katie the Maid was played by Ruth Parrott. Watch for Lucille Ball in the Columbia picture, Miss Grant Takes Richmond. And be sure to listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband again next week. Presented by J E L L O. The big red letters stand for the Jello family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jello family. That's Jello. Yum yum yum. Jello puddings. Yum yum yum. Jello cup. The yolka puddings are so Oh, it's 
Who all cab and syrup for my mind, mind, mind. With that real Northwest flavor so fine, oh so fine Blend it cane into a maple, it's tops on your table That real maple flavor does pancakes a favor It's log cabin syrup for my mind, mind, mind. Yes, Log Cabin is the syrup with that delicious Northwoods maple flavor. It's America's most popular quality table syrup. Enjoy it on waffles or pancakes for Sunday night suppers, as well as at breakfast. It's Log Cabin syrup for my, 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 my. Listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband again next week. Bob Amon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. visit to Riverdale. It's Saturday afternoon as we look in on the Andrews home, and at the moment, we find Mr. Andrews alone in the living room, sitting in his favorite armchair, reading the newspaper. And so the little girl said to her, Mommy, Mommy, what is it, girl? <laughs> Mommy said, well, I'll tell you in the future. <laughs> well, fact, she said, well, Poppy never does it. <laughs> oh, those kids, they can... <laughs> Yes, dear. Cell phone's ringing. Yeah, I hear it. Well, answer it. Well, Mary, I'm reading my... Fred. Yes, dear. Fine thing. Man can't even read his own newspaper. I don't know. He gets... Hello? Hello, Mr. Andrews? Yes? Oh, this is Veronica. Oh, hello, Veronica. Is Archie home? Yes, Archie's home. Does you want to talk to him? No, I don't. All right, I'll call him to the television. <laughs> you don't. Well, Veronica... Did you say you don't want to talk to Archie? That's right. But didn't you just ask me if he was home? That's right. But you don't want to talk to him, huh? Uh, Veronica, now I don't mean to sound unusually stupid, but uh, whom do you want to talk to? You. Uh, me? Uh-huh. You see, I'm in a little hurry right now, and our brother you just gave Archie a message for me. Oh, I see. Well, all right, Veronica, what is the message? Well... Over here this afternoon at three o'clock. Yeah. But I seem to make it four o'clock instead. Four o'clock instead. I'm going down to Stacy's department store to do some Christmas shopping this afternoon. Uh, do some Christmas shopping. There's only seven more days to Christmas, and this is about the last chance I'll have to get my shopping done. Yes, yeah, seven more days. Well, I don't know why I always leave my shopping the last minute. Uh, Veronica. Yes. Uh, wouldn't it be simpler if you just wrote Archie a letter? Uh, oh, you don't? My goodness, no. I don't even want to know I'm going shopping. You see, it's for his present. Just tell him the part about changing the date from three to four. No, no, all right, Veronica, I'll tell him. Oh, thanks ever so much, Mr. Oh, not at all, Veronica. Bye. Bye now. <laughs> uh, just tell him the part about changing the date from three to four, she said. Oh, oh that Veronica. You know, sometimes I think she's... Oh, hey, wait a minute. By George, it's a good thing Veronica called. I forgot all about Christmas shopping, and I still haven't bought anything for Mary and Archie. Oh, good grief. I'd better get my hat and coat and get down to Stacy's right now. This is the last chance I'll have to get him something. Yes, sir, it's a good thing I remembered that. Yes, sir, a good... Oh, fine. I, uh, yes, dear. Doorbell's ringing. I hear it, dear. I hear it. Oh, all right, dear. Yeah, no, all right, dear, she said. I do. You good grief, Jughead. Mr. Andrews. Yes, Jughead. Could you tell me something? Yeah? When most people see other people, most people always say hello. Yeah. But when people see me, they always say, Good grief, Jughead! Yeah. <laughs> yes? Why? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> well, now, Jughead, that is because you're such a... a I mean, you're a little under... Uh, well, 
No, wait. Now, you look so awfully... But uh, well, what I mean is, you have such a... <clears throat> Jughead, I don't have time now to explain things like that. I'm going out. Did you want to see Archie? Uh-huh. Is he home? Yes, I think so. Archie! Archie? Archie! Are you calling me, Dad? I am not calling the man in the moon. Come on down here. Jughead is here. Gee whiz, is he? Yes, Archie. He is he. I mean, he is. Gee, hi, Jug. Hi, Archie. I'll be right down. It's all right. Well, I'm glad that's settled. Oh, gee. Ah, Jughead, if you'll excuse me, I'll go get my hat now. Why? Because I'm going out. When? Well, right now. Where? Down to the... Jughead, you have to know everything I'm going to do. Uh-uh. Well, all right. Now, if you have no objections, I will get my hat and coat. Gee, uh-huh. hiya, Jug. Well, what brings you over here? Hi, Archie. I just came over to see what you're going to do. Who, me? Well, i got to meet Veronica in a little while, and then oh, we're going... Oh, Archie, uh, Veronica just called, and she said... She was she did? Uh, yes, Archie, she did. And she... See, I never heard the phone ring. Well, it rang. Well, now, why didn't you call me? Archie. Yes, Dad? Uh, do you care to hear what Veronica said or not? Oh, sure, Dad, sure. Then be quiet so I can tell you. Okay, Dad, okay. Okay. <laughs> now, she said to... Uh, ah, yeah. She said to change your apartment with her from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. From 3 to 4? That's right, yeah, an hour later. She was, I wonder why. Well, she said she had some things to attend to. Well, what kind of things? Well, I... Archie, I don't know. And what's more, I don't care. So stop asking foolish questions. I have to go out now, too. Well, gee was where are you going, Dad? Oh, down to the... Uh, I, I mean... Uh, <laughs> oh, just out. That's hmm? a few little things I have to attend to. Oh, okay, Dad. <laughs> see you later. Yes, yes, Archie. I'll see you later. Bye. She whiz. Hey, Mr. Andrews. Yes? He forgot to say goodbye to me. Goodbye, Jughead. Be a good boy while I'm gone. I will. Bye, Mr. Andrews. Archie. Yes, Jughead? On second thought, there was something about the way your father said that that I didn't like. No, Jug, forget it. But gee whiz, isn't that swell about Veronica changing our date? Huh? What's so swell about it? Well, now that Veronica's made our date an hour later, I have time to get my Christmas shopping done. But I don't want to... Well, this is practically the last chance I'll have. But I don't feel... Good thing I thought of it. But who was... I haven't bought a thing for anyone yet. Including me? Including you. Archie, it's high time you got your Christmas shopping done. That's right, Judge. Come on. We'll go right down to Stacy's department. What are you going to get me, huh? Judge, you'll have to wait... Answer the phone when I... Oh, that's funny. It's gone. What did he say? Hello? Hello, Mrs. Andrews. This is Betty. Oh, hello, dear. How are you? Oh, fine, thanks, Mrs. Andrews. Is Archie home? Yes, dear. I think he's upstairs. Archie! Archie? Archie! That's funny. He must have gone out, too. I wish people would tell me when they're going out. Uh, hello, Betty. Yes, Mrs. Andrews? Archie doesn't seem to be home. No, dear. And, Betty, I hate to cut you short, but I have to run now. I'm just leaving to do my Christmas shopping. This is the last chance I'll have. Oh, golly, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mrs. Andrews. I haven't done my shopping yet, either. You haven't? Well, would you like to go with me, dear? Oh, I'd love to, Mrs. Andrews. All right, Betty, I'll pick you up right away, and we'll both go down to Stacy's department store. <laughs> Such crowds. Yes, Jughead, but when we got in that elevator and everyone started pushing, did you have to push back? Listen, Archie, that crowd, even a sardine would have pushed back. Oh, well, never mind. Now we're here now. And first thing I gotta buy is a compact for Veronica. I wonder where the cosmetic department is anyway. Cosmetic department? Yeah. Gee whiz, Archie, let's go up to the sporting goods department first. Jug, we'll go up to the sporting goods department later. Come on, I'll ask that floor walker where the cosmetic department is. Gee whiz, okay. Oh, mister? Yes, yes. Uh, could you tell me where the cosmetic department is? Yes, yes, counter seven. Uh, thank you. Come on, Jug. Where is it? Counter seven. Where's that? Well, that's right over near... Gee, I don't know. 
Oh, mister? Yes? Where is counter seven? On the north side of counter six. Oh, thank you. I'll... <laughs> mister? Well, what now? Which way is north? Oh, my lands. Sonny, you see the boys' clothing department right there? Yes. Well, you just go right down to that aisle where the dummies are and turn right. Oh, okay, mister. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Yes, madam. Can I help you? Boy, he's sure not a very friendly floor walker, is he? Maybe his wife beats him. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, Jug. I wonder... Who... What was that? You bumped into that dummy. She was... Who, for a minute, I thought that dummy was a real person. Uh-oh. I knocked the hat off. Wait a second, Jug, till I put the hat back on this dummy. Okay. Well, if that sourpuss floor walker ever saw me bump into this dummy, he'd probably throw us right out of the store or something. I Jesus, was... look. What's the matter? There's Veronica. Veronica? Oh, gee whiz, if she sees me here, I won't be able to buy her a Christmas present. But she's coming right towards us. Oh, boy. Jug, I'm going to be a dummy. Huh? It's the only way I can hide from Veronica. I'm going to climb up on this platform with the rest of these dummies, and I'll wear this hat. But, Archie, I don't think you are. Jug, don't argue. How do I look? You're the most natural-looking dummy I ever saw. Now, Jug, don't be funny. Quick, take the price tag off the dummy's jacket and put it on me. Okay. Here it is. boy. now hang it on this button. Yeah, they're fine. Now, remember, Jug, don't give me away no matter what happens. Well, okay. But I still won't think... Now, quiet. Here she comes. Why, Jughead. Hello there. Oh, uh... Hi, you, Veronica. Hi, you. What are you all doing here? Just a little shopping. Oh, I am, too. But thank goodness I have most of it done. Oh, that's good. The only thing I still have to get is a gift for Archie. A gift for Archie? Uh-huh. But I don't know what to get him. He's such a problem. Such a... Yeah, he sure is. No use getting him a book, because he just isn't the intelligent type. Not the intelligent... And there's no use getting him a baseball glove because he's not much of an athlete. Not much of a... There's no sense getting him a tie because he just doesn't know anything about style. Of all the... In fact, times like this, I think Archie is an awful dummy. What? <laughs> but then again, prices being what they are, there isn't much you can get for a dollar. You know, a dollar? Did you say something, Jughead? For me, <laughs> Not a word, Veronica, not a word. Oh, well, I'd better keep looking. Would you like to come along? Oh, I, uh, uh, no, Veronica, I can't. I'm, uh, I'm meeting someone here in a minute. Oh, all right, Jackie. I'll run along. Bye now. Bye, Veronica, bye. Okay, dummy, you can relax now. <laughs> a fine thing, a fine thing. So Veronica thinks I'm not intelligent and not athletic and I don't know anything about styles and all she's going to spend is a dollar. <laughs> Well, that's a fine state of affairs. Of course, I... look out. Huh? Here comes a floor walker. Oh, boy, if he sees me up on this platform, I'll really have trouble. I'd better be a dummy some more. Mm. Yes, madam, yes. If it doesn't fit, you can return it at any time. Yes, ma'am. Oh, me, never have I seen such a rush. Never in all my days. Well, young man, what are you just standing there for? Me? Oh, I... I'm just waiting for a friend. Oh, for land's sake... Who put that dummy there? Oh, boy. That isn't the silliest looking dummy I've ever seen. I don't know why the stockroom can't send a dummy that at least looks half alive. I've never seen such an insipid inspection. Such a ridiculous posture. Major? Yes? I'm not really a dummy. Well, that makes absolutely no difference. You still shouldn't be... Good heavens, you're alive! Uh-huh. But hit it. Man, get off of there this minute. Get off of there. Uh, yes, sir. Well, what were you doing up there on that platform looking like a dummy? Well, that's a long story, sir. You I have never I would... in all my days heard anything like this. Well, yes, sir, but... but I, I have would... a good mind to take you to see Mr. Stacy, Mr. J.L. Stacy himself. Oh, don't do that, mister. I... Just would... what would your father say if he knew you were standing on that platform like a dummy? I don't think it would surprise him at all. Yes, yeah, but I... Young man, will you do me a favor? Yes, sir. As soon as you have paid for that jacket, leave the store. Yes, sir, I... What? Huh? I said, as soon as you finish buying that jacket, leave the store. Buying this jacket? Yes, that jacket you're wearing, the one with the price tag on it. You are buying it, aren't you? Oh, no, sir, I'm not buying it. This is my jacket. Your jacket? Yeah. Oh. Of course, you have the sales slip. Oh, no, I bought it here last and year. And you haven't removed the price tag yet? Removed the... 
Oh, mister, you don't understand. You Young man, I understand was... perfectly well. It's quite obvious that you were trying on that jacket and for some ridiculous reason decided to pose as a dummy. Oh, no but... doubt you thought you could get away with the jacket without paying for it. Oh, but I was just... The price is fourteen ninety five. I want the money right now. Oh, but I was just trying to... Oh, now I said... But you don't understand. This is my own jacket, Mr. Nofu. Jughead, tell the man this is my jacket and we... Jughead? Jughead! Young man, are you calling me names? No, no sir. I, I, I was talking to my friend. What friend? Well, that's just it. He, he was here a minute ago. She was... I bet he went up to the sporting goods department. Mister, if you just come up to the sporting goods department, we can find my friend and he'll tell you that this... Uh, young man, I am not going up to the sporting goods department or any other department until I have the $14.95 for that jacket. But that's all the money I have. I... Hey, wait a minute. Big pardon? I know. Mister, if I paid you for this jacket, you'd give me a sales slip, and then I could take it over to the exchange department and get my money back, couldn't I? You, uh, yes, 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 you could do that, I suppose. Oh, well, in that case, it's all right. I haven't anything to worry about. Here's the money. Thank you. Here's your sales slip. Thank you. You're Ooh. quite welcome. Good day, sir. Good day. <laughs> Guess I fooled him. Yes, sir. Good thing I think fast. <laughs> For a minute there, it looked like I wouldn't have any Christmas money. But now all I have to do is take my jacket and go to the exchange counter and give them this jacket and this... Gee whiz. If I do that, I'll have my money back all right, but I won't have my jacket. Oh, boy, now what am I going to do? <laughs> Well, now, let's see. First thing i better do is get that bottle of perfume for Mary. Uh, oh, here's the curtain counter right here. Uh, let's see now. What kind of perfume would Mary like? Gee, they certainly have quite an assortment. Let me see now. Chase me. $25 an ounce. Uh, hide and seek. $32 an ounce. Wallflower no more. Forty dollars an ounce? Hmm. I never smell anything worth that kind of money. Oh, here's another one. Evening in Riverdale. Ten dollars a bottle. Well, <laughs> that's a little better. Yes, and I think Mary likes this perfume, too. That's just what I'll get her. Hmm. Uh, oh, oh, uh, miss, I'll take this bottle of... Where's Mr. Andrews? Good great Jughead, what are you doing here? Call Mr. Andrews. I'm looking for Archie. Well, I thought you were with Archie. Oh, I was, but we sort of got separated. Oh, I see. Well, I'm trying to get one of these sales girls to wait on me, but they're all so Gee, busy. Gee whiz. I... What's the matter? There's Mrs. Andrews. Uh, Mary, where? Right over there, with oh, Betty. for good grief. What's she doing here now? If she sees me with this bottle of perfumes, you know what I'm getting her for Christmas. Well, she's coming this way. Yeah, I know. No. Oh, I'll just duck this bottle of perfume in my pocket there, right in this pocket. <laughs> now, if she sees me, I'll just say... Just that. a moment. I... Please. Just yeah. one moment. Huh? I saw that. You saw what? Oh. Oh. Oh! Oh, now, mister, you don't understand. You don't understand at all. Oh, I don't. I, don't I? No, you don't. Did you or did you not just hide a bottle of perfume in your pocket? Well, yes, I did, but... Have I... you paid for it? Well, no, but you... Well, I don't know what you call it, but we call it shoplifting. Yes, of course, it's shoplifting. Oh, oh now, wait a minute, mister. I'm, I'm not shoplifting anything. I, I can explain the entire thing. I'm listening. But, you see, I've been trying to get one of the sales girls to wait on me, and I just saw my wife over there, and I hid the bottle of perfume because I didn't want her to know what I'm getting her for Christmas. Just where is your wife? Well, she's right over there. Oh, oh, oh. Good grief, she's gone. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> but she was right there a minute ago. Now, uh, Jughead, you tell man how we saw my... Uh, 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 where the dickens did he go? Who? Jughead! He was standing right here just a second ago. I don't know where Mister, he... Mister! Uh, huh? Do you imagine these things very often? Uh, imagine? Why? Oh, what, Do you what? have delusions? Yeah, but I... Spells? Do you see spots before your eyes? But I... Oh, just keep calm. Just keep calm. There's no need to get excited. You just give me back the perfume and we'll forget the whole thing and you can go right home and lie down. Uh, lie down? Who wants to lie down? The perfume? Police? Um, 
Yes, sir. Here, I have it right in my... Something wrong? Uh, uh Uh-huh. It leaked. What leaked? The perfume bottle leaked all over my pocket. See, it's half empty. Oh, for land's sake. Uh. Now you have to pay for it. What? That's right. I was going to forget the whole incident, but I can't return a damaged bottle to the counter. Well, I certainly am not going to pay for a leaky bottle of perfume. Mister, if you're not satisfied with the item, you can take it to the exchange department. But I must be paid for it. But I... I said I must. Oh, me, all right, you win. I'll, I'll go to the exchange department. But how I get into these things, I'll never know. <laughs> Now, which bathroom do you like best, Betty? Mm, I think the dark blue one, Mrs. Andrews. I do, too. Blue is Aunt Hattie's favorite color. Oh, but is it the right size, Mrs. Andrews? Well, there's only one way to tell, Betty. I'll have to try this bathrobe on. Try it on? Uh Uh-huh. I wear the same size that Aunt Hattie does. Oh. And if it fits me, it'll fit her. Um... Here, hold my coat, dear, while I step into this dressing room and put this bathroom on. All right, Mrs. Andrews. Just take me a second, dear. I'd hate to go to all the trouble of buying this and sending it to Hattie and then not have it fit. Uh Then I'd only have to return it for her since she lives in the... Oh, dear. What is it? There's no hanger in here for my dress. Oh, well, hand your dress to me, Mrs. Andrews. I'll hold it. All right, dear. Here you are. I have it. Thanks, dear. I'll have this robe on in a minute. There Ah, how does that look, Betty? Well, it looks a little big to me, Mrs. Andrews. It does? Well, I'd better take a look in the mirror. I... Oh, Betty, you don't have to hold my coat and dress. Just put them on that empty rack. Oh, all right, Mrs. Andrews. Uh, let's see. Uh, hmm. Yes, it is a little big. It sure is. I'll have to ask the sales girl if she has a smaller size. I'll wait here, Betty. Oh, Miss. Miss, could you help me with this, please? I'm she whiz, Betty. Jughead, what are you doing here? Looking for Archie. Archie, is he here? Well, I think so. We came here together, but we got separated. Oh, well, what happened? Well, you see, he was being a dummy. What? He was a dummy. You know, those things that look like this. Jughead, what are you talking about? Uh, excuse me, miss. Gonna move this rack here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Sam, get the other end there. Yeah, I got it. Now, easy, now, easy. Yeah, okay. Well, Jughead, what are you trying to tell me about Archie? Betty, it's an awful long story. All I want to know is, have you seen him? No, I haven't. Well, then I better keep looking for him. He may be in trouble, and i got to find him. Well, Jughead, what kind of trouble is he in? I can't tell you now, Betty. See you later. Jug, wait, Jug! Oh, golly, that Jughead, he's the strangest... Well, Betty, how do you like this bathrobe? Oh, that's fine, Mrs. Anders, but guess who was just here? This size does fit much better, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, Mrs. Anders, but do you know who I just oh, saw? Oh, Betty! What happened to it? What happened to what? The rack. What rack? The rack you put my dress on. Golly, it's gone. But my dress, my dress and my coat were on it. Oh, golly, it was here a minute ago. Oh, my dress. Betty, what'll I do? There's something wrong, madam. Yes, I lost my dress. I beg your pardon? My dress. We put it down here for a minute while I tried on this bathrobe, and now it's gone. The bathrobe? No, the dress. No, no, it couldn't be. But it is, isn't it, Betty? Yes, indeed, Mrs. Oh, Andrews. Oh, my land, I have day. never seen such a day. Oh. Living dummies, men hiding from their wives, and now this woman loses her dress. But I, I, I tell you, it was right under my nose. Well, I should hope so. Well, do something, do something. Madam, what can I do about your dress? Find it. Now, madam, be calm, just be well, calm. It was probably taken by mistake, and it will be returned to the lost and found department. Well, where's that? At the other end of the floor, next to the exchange department. Oh, come on, Betty. Madam, where are you going? To the lost and found department. But, madam, certainly not in that bathrobe. Well, certainly not without it. Hey, Archie. Jughead, where the dickens have you been? Looking for you. I know that, but where did you go when I was arguing with the floor walker? I don't know. I turned around and looked at something, and the next thing I knew, you were gone. Oh, great. And just because you weren't there to tell him that this jacket is really my own, I had to pay him for it. For your own jacket? Yeah, the price tag was still on it. That's what I'm standing in this line for. This is the exchange department, and i got to try and get my money back. Sure, how are you going to get your jacket back? I don't know, but this is all your fault, Jughead. My fault? Yes, my fault. Now, listen, Archie, what did I do? I only... Archie, 
What in charnation are you doing here? She was dead. Where'd you come from? Never mind where I came from. What are you doing standing here in your shirt sleeves? Well, Dad, I can explain. You see, I came Fred, in here with Jughead and... What are you doing here? Mary, what are you doing in your bathroom? Oh, Fred, it's not my bathroom. But... Fred Andrews, you smell. You... What? <laughs> you positively reek of perfume. Oh, well, well, yes, dear, I know I do, but you, you see, dear, I was... Andrews, what are you doing here? Veronica. Jughead, why didn't you tell me Archie was here? Oh, Veronica, we were trying to... Just what seems to be the trouble here? Dear, oh, the floor walker. Well, look, mister, I'm trying to find out why my son is standing here in his shirt sleeve. Yeah, please, there's no need to get... And I want to know why you smell a perfume. Lady, and what are you I'm doing in that bathroom? Mister, please, please don't... change my own tummy, will, will, will you just... Get here, Archie. Girlie, will you... Let me stop your dress. Why, 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 That's better. Now, listen to me, all of you. This nonsense has gone far enough. Too far, in fact. Yes, Mr. Andrews. Andrews. Yes, dear. Yes, Dad. I should say so. But all uh, afternoon, uh, you people have made life quite miserable for me. Quite miserable. Yes. yes. Now, if there is any reason for it, I feel I'm entitled to an explanation. Well, mister, you know this coat? The one you thought I was buying? Yes. Well, my mother and father and Jughead and Veronica can all tell you that it's my own old coat. Why, of course. Yes, I yes, I yes, 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 yes. Oh, Oh, dear. You mean it really is his coat? I told you. Yes, and perhaps oh. you recall that you didn't believe my wife was in the store when I hid the perfume bottle in my pocket. Well, yes, but... Well, I... sir, this lady is my wife. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Yeah, I'm very and sorry. And I just found out that two of your men moved an empty rack while I was talking to Jughead here, didn't they, Jughead? Sure they did. And that was the rack that had my dress and coat on it. Well, Mr. Floorwalker, what do you say to that? Yeah, oh, please, 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 no temper, please. please. The customer is always right at J.L. Stacy's. We'll make amends. Mistakes will happen, you know. Now, young man, since that does seem to be your own coat, you may keep it and I'll give you a cash credit slip for what you paid me. And you, sir, yes? I'll be glad to give you another bottle of perfume, compliments of the store. Well. And, madam, yes. I'm sure we can find your dress and coat in the lost and found department, and you may keep that bathrobe at no charge. Well, thank you. I'm here, too. <laughs> so be quiet. Well, people, will that satisfy you? Well, yes, I think that straightens out everything. I'm sorry, there's been so much misunderstanding. Oh, that's quite all right, quite all right. And I... now, folks, if everything's settled, let's stop hiding from each other and get this Christmas shopping over and done with once and for all. Yes, Mr. Andrews. Yes, dear. All yes, right. Sir. Now, I... Uh... What's that? That's the five o'clock bell. Store's closing. You folks will all have to come back Monday. I'll come back. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, you do this again? Oh, oh, oh. The Andrews will be back in just a minute, but first, would you like to get $6.25 for just signing your name? Well, that's what happens when you sign up for a $25 United States savings bond. You pay $18.75, and in 10 short years, you get back $25. Good idea to invest in a lot of saving bonds at that rate, wouldn't you say? It's easy for you parents to save regularly. Join the payroll saving plan where you work. It's an automatic, systematic way to save savings bonds regularly. First of this Christmas week, without fail, sign up where you work for payroll savings. For the hard person on your Christmas list, give a savings bond. A savings bond makes a perfect gift, a gift that keeps on giving. Remember, savings bonds cost eighteen seventy-five, pay back $25 in 10 short years. For Christmas, give United States savings bonds. <laughs> Now, back to the Andrews. It's Monday night as we look in on the Andrews' home, and the family has just come home from Stacy's department store. Oh, oh, Mary, it certainly is good to be home. It certainly is. Whew. You know, I'm dead. I am too, dear. I've never seen such a mob. Neither have I, but at least we got all our shopping done. And if I never set foot in a crowded department store again, it'll still be too soon. Oh, well, gee whiz. Oh, what is uh, it, Archie? This letter from Uncle George. Uncle George? Uh-huh. He sent us a $50 gift certificate from J.O. Stacy's department store. Oh, no! no.
program transcribed. So, you think you're smart. You think you could top a flautist? A landscaper? <laughs> what was that? I don't know. I can't even spell it. Okay. Do you think you could top a flautist, a landscaper, or an underwear salesman? I can spell that. Well, then prove it. Come on out and play. Meet your match. <laughs> The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Pete Show Match. Radio's exciting new quiz game where your neighbors prove they're smarter than the next fellow and win prizes until they meet their match. And someone gets the chance to beat the brain for that big jackpot each week. But more about that later, because now here's your match with Beat Your Match host and referee, radio's famous man about town, Tom Moore! <laughs> Thank you, Jack Fuller. And uh, good evening, everybody. Well, we uh, want to welcome you to meet your match. Jack, you got us off to a fine start there. You've uh, told some things here that I don't know whether we ought to have on the radio or not. But we'll find out what all these people do. We've got a lot of prizes, a lot of questions, and ten people from our studio audience, each with a different occupation. We've asked someone in the audience to help us start the game by selecting the first contestant. <laughs> you know who it'd be. It's the uh, flautist. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Let's find out what this pretty girl does. Good evening, Miss Flautist. Good evening. Just what is a flautist? One who plays the flute. Oh, well, for heaven's sake. Well, you just had us all startled. You know that. How long have you been playing the flute? Well, that'd be getting my age away. <laughs> you mean you've played it practically since you were born? No. All but eight years with my all wife. All but eight years. How long have you been playing the flute? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. That's a pretty difficult instrument, isn't it? No, it isn't very difficult. It takes a lot of practice and concentration. How many hours a day do you practice? Well, as a student, when I was studying the flute very seriously, I wanted to make it my profession. I'd study four and five, practice four and five hours a day besides taking two and three lessons a week. No kidding. Now you're teaching the flute, yes, is that I it? Yes, I am. Well, now that you've learned all about it, how often do you practice? How many hours a day? Well... Some of my pupils may be listening, so I'd better not admit that. <laughs> oh, but then it isn't true. Once a flautist, always a flautist. I mean, you still have to practice. Oh, yes. Well, definitely. God, Ray, that's very interesting. Excuse me, Tom. Well, why, did, Miss Flautist, do they call flautist flautist when they don't call them flutists? If they yeah, that's flute? what I want to know. Jack. Well, uh, right now, I think we should call flutist flautist is quite an old name for it. And I think we are in the modern Well, age. no wonder Jack Fuller calls you a flautist. It's yeah. an old word. Of course, I'm a pretty old fella. Oh, there's right. right. Well, Get we're around. glad you're with us tonight, and you have a chance to take home a lot of prizes if you're real smart tonight, Miss uh, Flutist, huh? That's right. All right, good. Now, here's how we play Meet Your Match. You're going to pick a person to play against from the contestants here on the stage. You can pick a construction engineer, a shoe repairman, a cake decorator, an artist, a weaver, a retail grocer, a landscaper, an income tax man, <laughs> bless his heart, and an underwear salesman. Now, of course, the point is to try to pick somebody that you think you can beat, because for every person you select and prove you're the smarter, you win a prize, and here's how. Now, if you answer a question correctly, you each get one question per round. If you answer correctly and he misses, you win the round and the prize. But now, if you miss and he answers correctly, you've met your match, and your opponent takes over the microphone and chooses his victim. Understand? Yeah. Now, as long as you stay up there, Miss Flutist, winning rounds, you can stay right there and pick your victims. And if you're still up there at the end of the show, you'll be the one who has a chance to beat the brain for our great big jackpot. But more about that later. Right now, Miss Flutist, pick your poison or your victim. Who do you think you can beat? Just look them over there. Oh, I think I can beat the shoe repairman. A shoe repairman. All right, let's have him come up to the microphone. Our flutist believes she's smarter than this shoe repairman. Good evening, sir. How do you do? You are a shoe repairman. That's right, sir. How long have you been engaged in that interesting occupation? Oh, about uh, two and a half years. You like it? Well, yes. What did you do before you repaired shoes? Oh, uh, assembly work factory. Well, how'd you happen to get into this other line? My brother-in-law. A brother-in-law took you into the business. That's right. Well, that's good. Are you a pretty good cobbler? Well, I think so. What kind of souls do you like to work with? 
sole? Yeah. Leather sole. Uh, invisible. What sort of heels do you like? <laughs> Don't answer that. All right, let's go on here. You've been chosen by our flutist because she believes she's smarter than you. Now, let's see who meets his match this round. Mr. Shoe Repairman, if you were traveling throughout the Far East, you would see many pagodas. What is a pagoda? Is it a mountain peak, a tall tower, or a small boat? Tall tower. Certainly, usually built in stories. Do that. Very good. Now, Miss Flutus, here's something that should be right down your alley. This is the time of year when joyous tin tin abulations are most appropriate for the season. Does this refer to the singing of Christmas carols, the ringing of bells, or gay holiday parties? Yes. This is the time of year when joyous tin tin abulations are most appropriate to the season. Does this refer to the singing of Christmas carols, the ringing of bells, or gay holiday parties? Do you know? Well, I'll guess. Guess? What is it? Uh, Christmas carols. You know, for a professional musician, you should have known that, my dear. It's the ringing of bells. A tin-tin abulum is a bell used in many symphony orchestras, among other places. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't. Well, I'm real sorry, young lady. You've met your match, and our shoe repairman is the winner of this first round. You're doing yourself proud, young man, and here's your prize. A Parker pen and pencil set. The smooth gliding Parker 21 fountain pen with the new octanium point for easy writing together with a companion pencil, which we hope you like. All right, sir. Mr. Shoe Repairman, you have a construction engineer, a cake decorator, an artist, a weaver, a retail grocer, a landscaper, an income tax man, and an underwear salesman to choose from. Which shall it be? Oh, try the weaver. The weaver? Oh, you're picking her because she's so pretty. I know. Well, that may be. <laughs> yes, I think it is. Let's bring her up to the microphone. Good evening, ma'am. Hello. You are a weaver by trade. Yes. Well, that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Huh? Well, it's uh, more or less repairing clothes, not oh, weaving cloth. I see. When I burn a hole in my coat with a cigarette, are you one of those kids that can... Yes, uh-huh. Well, no kidding. That's kind of delicate work, huh? It is. It uh, takes... About five years to really learn it. How long have you been at it? Two. Oh. I'm more or less learning. <laughs> then you're an apprentice weaver, aren't yes, you? Yes, uh-huh. Well, we got that off. Are you looking forward to the day when you're a real honest-to-goodness one? Yes, I am. That's real. Uh, do you do that through a magnifying glass? I've often wondered. No. You just have to have mm-hmm. good eyesight. Just huh? good eyesight. I see. Of course, I do wear glasses. You do? Mm-hmm. Why haven't you got them on tonight? <laughs> I left them home. Why? Because I wasn't going to do any weaving. Oh! <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what you were planning to do either. <laughs> All right, Miss Weaver, we're glad you're here. You've been challenged by our shoe repairman because he believes he's smarter than you. Let's see who's right and who meets his match. Miss Weaver, in what city is the famous Scotland Yard located? Is that in Edinburgh, Manchester, or London? London. Why, yes, London. You bet. Very good. All right, here's one for you, Mr. Shoe Repairman. Where has President Truman with his family been vacationing most recently? Was it Sea Island, Georgia, Key West, Florida, or Hot Springs, Arkansas? Key West, Florida. Certainly was. That boy reads the papers. Good. Nobody met the match this round, so now we'll try another one. Miss Weaver, listen carefully now. The questions are harder when you both missed one. There, how many points are there... On the Maltese cross, as worn by the Knights of Malta, are there four points, six points, or eight points on the Maltese cross? Well, I'll guess four. You just guessed half enough, my dear. Eight points formed by four arrowheads joining at their points. You've seen the Maltese cross, haven't you? No, I don't recall. You don't recall? Well, there are eight points. I'm sorry. You may have met your match. Let's see how our shoe repairman does with this. Mr. Shoe Repairman, what is the measurement of a cord of wood? Is it 9 by 6 by 3, 6 by 2 by 2, or 8 by 4 by 4, a cord of wood? I'd say 8 by 4 by 4. You said it absolutely right. You want to run around the machinery and mess your man. Just doing 
fine, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yes, indeed you are. And here's what we uh, we have for you that I think you'll like. This will make it nice and easy for people to come into your shoe shop, and you'll know they're coming, and your nerves won't get jangled. It's a set of written house door chimes. You can, can stop use them. You can. Yes, you can also stop doorbell nerves with written house door chimes. Good. Well, you're just doing fine. Now I want you to stand up there and look over this other bunch that's waiting for you. Because uh, I'll be back to ask you who you're going to challenge in just a moment. But right now, I want to have a little uh, talk with Jack Fuller. What was it, Jack? Well, Tom, the one who beats the brain. We want to talk about the brain for just a moment. Okay. The one who beats the brain wins a whole host of prizes. And one of our neighbors here on the stage is going to get that chance tonight. What, the brain? Well, I am the brain. I have a question. I know the answer. Do you? <laughs> yes, the brain has a question. And his brain teaser will really open the door to a treasure chest of gifts. If you can give the answer. And you folks at home can play Meet Your Match, too, and here's how. Make up a brain teaser for the brain. A first or limerick about some famous personality, living or dead, and send it to Meet Your Match. If it's used, Meet Your Match will pay you $100 plus a beautiful prize. Just send your brain teaser to Meet Your Match, the Mutual Broadcasting System, New York, New York. That's Meet Your Match, the Mutual Broadcasting System, New York, New York. All questions become the property of Meet Your Match, and the decision of our judges is final. In cases of exact duplicates, only the first will be considered. And now back to your match with Meet Your Match host, Tom Moore. Thank you, Jack Fuller. Well, now we have a shoe repairman up here who's doing pretty good so far, folks. He hasn't met his match. Let's get right into another round and see how he does. Who have you picked out, Mr. Shoe Repairman? How about the uh, underwear salesman? The underwear salesman. All right, fine. Let's have that gentleman come up to the microphone. And here he comes. How do you do, sir? Hello, Tom. How are you tonight? Well, how are you? You are a salesman of unmentionable uh, articles of apparel, right? That's right. Fine. Uh, All kinds? No. No? The long, woolly kind? Yes. Do you demonstrate your own product? No. Nope. <laughs> I just wondered, where do you sell those things mostly now? Iowa. In Iowa? Well, those folks out there have got good sense, believe me. It gets cold as the dickens in Iowa. Well, sir, you've been challenged by our shoe repairman, Mr. Salesman, uh, because he believes he's smarter than you. Let's see who meets his match here. Mr. Salesman, I'm going to read three well-known expressions, and I want you to tell me what each one means. Hang one's head, keep one's head, and give one his head. Now, what does hang one's head mean? To allow the head to droop. Is that what you mean? No, it's, uh, if I, if you saw me over there and you said, look at old Maury's hanging his head, what would I be doing? I mean, why would I be doing it? What oh, in shame. Mean? Yes, I'd be ashamed. Good. Fine. Now... Wait a minute, you have two more to go. You get the idea now, don't you? Yes, All I right. Think I understand. If you say there's old Moore, he's a man who keeps his head, what does that mean? He doesn't get excited. Right, he stays calm. Good. All right. Then we'll say there's old Moore over there. Let's give him his head. What does that mean? Let him do as he wishes. Yeah, I wish somebody'd say that to me sometime. <laughs> too. You're absolutely right. Good. All right, you're past the barrier. Now let's see how our shoe repairman does. Mr. Shoe Repairman, what's the difference between a dressing gown and a dressing down? Now, what's a dressing gown? What's the, uh... Dressing gown. Usually gown, uh, worn over a nightgown, feminine. Yeah, bathrobe, sure. All right, go ahead. Now, what's a dressing down? That's when, uh... Boss somebody out or Absolutely somebody out. right. You bet. Very good. Okay. They both survived that round, so we'll make the questions a little tougher for this one. Mr. Salesman, what is the name of the fashionable neighborhood in the West End of London, England? Is it Park Place, Lundy's Lane, or Mayfair? Mayfair. Certainly is. It's Mayfair. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Shoe Repairman. Jersey cattle were so named because of the territory in which they originated. Did they originally come from New Jersey, off the coast of France, or Australia? Jersey cattle. Uh, 
Would you say New Jersey, off the coast of France, or Australia? I'd say off the coast of France. Right! The island of Jersey! Off the coast of France. Very good. Hey, we got a couple of spikes up here now, haven't we? All right, sir, here is one now for our uh, underwear salesman. Uh, what, Mr. Underwear Salesman, is a trundle tail? Is it a monkey, a curly-tailed dog, or a folding bed? A trundle tail. Would you repeat that? Yes, I will. What is a trundle tail? Is it a monkey, a curly-tailed dog, or a folding bed? I believe that's a folding bed. I'm real sorry that you're incorrect. A trundle tail is a curly-tailed dog or a cur. I'm very sorry. It's a tough question, but I told you it would be. We have an equally tough one for our friend, the shoe repairman, Mr. Shoe Repairman. If you begin a race in advance of another person, you have a head start. Now tell me, what is a red start? Is it a bird, a fresh person, or a sharp-pointed missile? I'd have to guess. That's it. It's a... Uh... Uh, a bird, a fresh person, a sharp-pointed missile. Sharp-pointed missile. No, sir. It's a small European singing bird, so nobody's met their match this round either. <laughs> All right, here we are now with another question for our underwear salesman. Panama hats are not made of the usual felt or straw that other men's hats are made from. They're made from cloth, leaves, or crushed needles. Are, are those three classifications? Yes. Our Panama hats made from cloth, leaves, or crushed needles? They're made from cloth. No, sir, they're not. The stemless leaves of the screw pine. I mean, oh, my dear sir, I thought you might know that. All right, here's our shoe repairman now. Listen very carefully. Many fabrics and furs can be determined as to authenticity by mere touch. Now, how can real alligator skin be determined? By scratching it, rubbing it, or by lifting a scale? Lifting a scale. You bet! Lifting a scale in Boston Underwear Sales only. Mr. Underwear Sales. Hey, you're doing fine, you know that? Yes, you are. And here's your prize for winning this round, Mr. Shoe Repairman. An attractive and dependable Whitnor watch. A distinguished member of the Longines Whitnor family of fine watches. Congratulations. Yeah, Instead of for myself, may I have it for my wife? Into the microphone. What is it? Instead of uh, for myself, may I have a woman for my wife? You mean you'd like to have a lady's watch for Mama for Christmas? Yes, sir. You bet your sweet life. Oh, boy, we're going to get a kiss. That's well. All right. Very well now. You're doing just fine. We have left for you to choose from a construction engineer, a cake decorator, an artist, a retail grocer, a landscaper, and an income tax man. Uh, the cake decorator? The cake decorator. Come up, young lady. Yes, indeed, a cake decorator. She looks like a decoration on a cake herself. Hi. Now, right into the microphone, young lady. You are a cake decorator. Yes, sir. You mean you're the one of the people that puts all that fancy stuff on there? Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that charming? I, uh, how would you spell, uh, I mean, uh, what sort of letters do you use on a birthday cake for a man, for instance? Fancy scroll letters or block letters? If I wanted to write, for instance... Happy birthday, Jack. What sort of letters would you use? Well, I just use my own handwriting. Your I own handwriting. Any special. And, and what would it say when you got through with it? Happy birthday, Jack. Right. And let's all give old Jack Fuller a great big round of applause. Happy birthday. <laughs> Jack is celebrating his 34th birthday tonight for the seventh time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's kind of delicate work, isn't it? You have to learn to do that and be kind of fancy? Uh, yes, you have to go to school usually. Uh, to a cake decorator school? That's right. Sounds like kind of fun. Do you ever sample the stuff? Quite often, yes. <laughs> Good. We're going to have a musical question for you, Miss Cake Decorator. You've been challenged by our shoe repairman because he believes he's smarter than you. Let's see who turns out to be right. Time for organist Harold Turner to put his musical question in for this evening. And Harold says that each of your three songs contains the name of a state. I want you to tell me the state in each instance. All right, Harold, here we go. What's the first one? Now, you only have to get two out of three out of this, of course. Do you know what that one is? 
A wonderful old song. It was never as popular as I thought it should have been for such a beautiful melody. Do you know the name of it? I guess it's Alabama. Why, yes, of course. What do you mean you guess it's Alabama? <laughs> Certainly. Stars fell on Alabama. All right, here's our second song. Tell me the state we mentioned in this song. Boxes around. What is that? Pennsylvania. She knew it. Pennsylvania. Pulsa. Very good. All right, fine. You've got two out of three. Let's see how our shoe repairman does. Mr. Shoe Repairman, here's our musical question for you. If you had the blues, musically speaking, what cities would you have in mind according to these tunes that Harold Turner plays? What, uh, what city in this first one? Now, the blues is actually named after a very famous street called Beale Street. What city are you in? Can you tell me? That be New Orleans? No, no. It's Memphis. The Memphis Blues. You still have a chance. There are two more, and you only have to get two out of three. What city are we talking about in this particular type of blues song? St. Louis. St. Louis. You bet he knew that. Here's another uh, blues song about a famous street in a famous city. The title of the song, of course, is Basin Street. Now, what city are we in? No help, please, folks. That should be New Orleans. It should be, and it absolutely is. Good, good. All right, fine. That's time. Oh, my goodness gracious. I suppose you heard our... 34-year-old boy wonder over there yell, uh, match time. <laughs> well, that means that uh, whichever one of you folks is standing up here at the microphone now at the end of this round will be the one with a chance to beat the brain for our great big jackpot. That agreeable with you, Miss Cake Decorator? Yes, and with you, Mr. Shoe Repairman? Yes, sir. Good. All right. Of course, the questions are a little tough now. So let's begin. Miss Cake Decorator, the word burrow may be spelled in three different ways. And, of course, it has three different meanings. Now, can you give me the correct spelling of the three words, all of which we pronounce burrow? Now, one of them, of course, means the donkey. How do you spell that? I believe it would be uh, B-U-R-R-O-W. Oh, no. No, that was the next one. That's a hole made by animal. I'm real sorry. And then there's a burrow in an incorporated town or district section of the city. I'm afraid that if our shoe repairman gets this, my dear, you've met your match, and he'll be up here to beat the brain. Mr. Shoe Repairman, listen very carefully. Reprocessed wool is made from cloth, which has never been used or worn, has been worn many times, or has been worn once or twice. Reprocessed wool. Has never been worn, has been worn many times, or has been worn once or twice. It's been worn many times. No, sir, I'm sorry. It's exactly the opposite meaning. It's cloth that has never been used or worn. I'll bet you knew it, too, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that means we have to have another round now. Here's one for our cake decorator. Young lady, listen carefully now. In England, a famous name is Ben Nevis. Is this an actor, a mountain, or a castle? Ben Nevis. We'll have to guess on that and say it's a castle. No, I'm sorry. It's the highest mountain in Great Britain. You've got another chance, Mr. Shoe Repairman. Now, listen carefully. The famous Liberty Bell originally had another name. Was it the Colonial Bell, the State's Bell, or the Province Bell? I'd say the Province Bell. You said it absolutely right, Mr. Shoe Repairman. You bet your last, and our shoe repairman's been up here all through the show. All right, now, I want you to tell me, first of all, so we can get on with the game and address you properly, will you give us your name, please, sir, in your hometown? Les Wooster. Les Wooster. W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R. Oh, Worst, Worcester, then, yes. isn't it? All right. And where do you live, Les? Downers Grove. Downers Grove, Illinois. Well, good for you, Les. You're, you did a swell job tonight. 
Now, Lass, I want you to sit there and think for a while. Just kind of take things easy, because we're going to tell you all the prizes you'll win now if you beat the brain. What are they, Jack? First of all, a Stromberg Carlson radio phonograph combination with AM and FM. There's nothing finer than a Stromberg Carlson. Plus a luxurious $500 Longines watch, the world's most honored watch, a product of the Longines Wittenauer Watch Company. Plus a beautiful two-piece match set of Halliburton luggage, aluminum travel cases, precision cases made to last a lifetime. And to go with it, a set of King's Men, the world's finest toiletries for men, in the famous flagons of fired 23-karat gold. Plus the wonderful new $1 catalog of Spiegel Incorporated, and with that Spiegel catalog will be a $500 merchandise certificate. Plus a pair of twin-size, extra-long Kimport Regent quilted top box springs and mattresses, and two pairs of six-inch Long Boy bed rail extensions from the Long Boy Company of Los Angeles. Plus a portable fold-away Thor Automagic Glad Iron for perfect ironing in half the time with half the effort. Plus, <clears throat> a five-year supply of famous nationally advertised blue swan lovely lingerie, including sus pants, minikins, and luxurious blue swan slips, gowns, and pajamas. Your wife can use those. Fine. Now, uh... Also, here's a beautiful Columbia diamond ring. Columbia, truly the gem of devotion. Plus, a pair of comfortable Burklock chairs in which you can relax and rock. The three-in-one chair from the Burklock Corporation and a pair of world-famous Rembrandt lamp masterpiece reflector table lamps in rich tooled metal. Plus $200 worth of Corday perfume. Corday's French perfumes, including their newest lasting fragrances, Fame Jet and Toujours Moi. Plus, a grand gas range with a charcoalator broiler, meat oven, and the exclusive safety feature, the safety key, made by Grand Home Appliances, Cleveland, Ohio. Then there's a wonderful gift for the home, Mr. Wooster, a Speed Queen home laundry, America's finest and fastest washer and ironer, that's Speed Queen. All these, plus durable beauty for your home. Any two rooms covered with easy-to-care-for Floorever Vitalite, plastic floor covering. Non-porous floor ever is made by Delaware Floor Products. Now, as an additional gift to all those who played Meet Your Match tonight, Double Glow is awarding a 123-piece set of America's most beautiful Christmas tree decorations. Everything needed to trim your tree in giant size packages of fireproof Double Glow. And, and we have something nice, too, Tom, for those who didn't win a prize tonight. Excuse me, interrupting. Well, that's all right. What is it, Jack? Well, for the ladies, a sensational new collector's item. Compact by Bullet called Lip Lock. It combines compact and lipstick in one. You'll find it as efficient as it is handsome. And for the man, a wonderful stern crest pipe of imported briar, banded in 14 karat gold from the L.H. Stern Company. Well, that's just swell. Now, Mr. Shoe Repairman, Mr. Les Wooster of Downers Grove, Illinois, you're the man who has a chance to beat the brain for all those wonderful prizes. And I don't think you'd have to worry about Mama's Christmas present if you got that stuff, would you? No, sir. Say, by the way, Les, uh, do you drive a car? I don't own a car. You I don't do own, drive. You do drive, but you don't own a car. How do you get around? Well, I took the uh, train in from... Oh, well, we're going to take care of that. First, I was going to give you a set of tires, but since you don't have any other means of transportation, here for winning that final round is a streamlined Schwinn bicycle, the aristocrat of fine bicycles. Okay. Fine. <laughs> All right, good. Now, Les, here we go, and I want to tell you that we all wish you well tonight. We hope you get it. Brain. You'll just have 15 seconds to answer when this old fella gets through with you. Brain, what's the question? I am the brain. Here is my question. Who is this personality? Two on a line, too shy to be three. A pig and a poke, but no poke you can see. A fruit, a fruition, a meadow, a glade. An insect, a mule, a child left afraid. A race of great kings, a star and an oar. A juggle, a jest, no mark but a score. He's mead mad and tipsy. He paints on blue sky. A comic, his genius no man can deny. Who's this personality? I know the answer. Now, just a minute, Les, before you answer, I'm going to ask the brain for his final clue. What is it, brain? Here's a fact this clue yields. The man's last name rhymes with shield. You'll have 15 seconds, Mr. Les Wooster. Who do you think the brain's talking about? Go. Who? Rhymes with shield? That's what Rhymes he said. That's Rhymes what he said. Who do you think it might be? Quick, time's about up. Take I'm a guess. Right, it could be any... Oh, guess somebody, man. Do you know? No, I don't. Oh, the time's up and he didn't even guess. Wow, shucks. 
We'll see you again next Saturday night on Meet Your Match, folks. Good night. This program came from Chicago. We hope that you've enjoyed this recording. And for more happy listening, please visit otrcat.com. Foregoing program transcribed, this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks written by Al Lewis. Well... The holiday season is practically with us. To our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, it means more than just a respite from the rigors of a difficult school term. Yes, it means that I'll get a chance to relax and observe the change that takes place in people as Christmas approaches. It's almost visible. The spirit of camaraderie and warm good fellowship which flows between us like a bountiful stream. I only hope that this season our beloved principal, Mr. Osgood Conklin, will get a little on him. <laughs> I was talking about his temper to my landlady last Friday morning at breakfast. I can't understand it, Mrs. Davis. Everything I do lately seems to rub Mr. Conklin the wrong way. What do you mean, Connie? Well, take yesterday, for instance. I was in his office when I saw his lighted cigar lying on the rug unnoticed. Naturally, I stooped over and picked it up. Wouldn't you? Well, I gave up smoking a long time ago. (laughs) I didn't want the office to catch on fire, Mrs. Davis. So I merely put the cigar in an ashtray. You might not believe this, but he was furious. Because you put his cigar back in the ashtray? Well, it wasn't exactly an ashtray. I guess I should have noticed it with an inkwell. (laughs) Oh, and when you put his cigar in the inkwell, it went out? That isn't the end I put in the inkwell. (laughs) Three puffs later, Mr. Conklin could have won first prize in the chow dog contest. (laughs) You'd think having a blue tongue was a crime. (laughs) Maybe it was the taste of the ink he objected to. He's always been a finicky eater anyway. (laughs) But forget about Mr. Conklin, Connie. Just stay out of his way as much as possible. Believe me, I'll do my best, Mrs. Davis. Say, that's quite a batch of mail you've got there. Is it all for you? Mail? Oh, this isn't incoming mail, Connie. These are the letters I picked up from all the kids in the neighborhood. You see, um... Bush's department store has a contest each year in which the child who writes the best letter to Santa Claus gets his choice of anything in the toy department. Oh, and you're Santa's helper. Mm -hmm. Well, I shop there anyway, so I just dropped them off for the kids. They write such cute letters, some of them. Reminds me of the one you wrote to Santa when you were seven years old. Me? Where did you see that, Mrs. Davis? Forgive me, Connie, but I've got it right here. I took it out of your old album. You know, the scrapbook with the souvenirs in it. You had it out last night. Remember? Oh, that's right. I thought I might run across some souvenir money in it. <laughs> Let's see the letter, Mrs. Davis. Here you are, dear. Read it out loud. I get such a kick out of it. All right. It says, Dear Sandy Claus. Look at this spelling. S-A-N-D-Y-C-L-A-W-S-S-S. <laughs> that's nice. One S for each claw. <laughs> Read on, dear. I don't want you to bring me very much toys at all, because then you would not have enough for all the other little children. Wasn't I a doll? (laughs) Please, Sandy, just bring me a slate with some chalk and a eraser and some crayons and a ruler on account, because when I grow up, I want to be a English teacher. Signed, Connie Brooks, age seven. (laughs) Isn't that touching, Mrs. Davis? Even at that tender age, I was already planning my future poverty. You knew what you wanted, all right. Now, I'll just set these letters on the sideboard and pour us some coffee. Here's your cup, Connie. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. i better hurry. Walter Denton is picking me up this morning. Can we give you a lift? No, thank you. I'm going over to Bush's department store. They have a contest each year in which a child who writes the best letter to Santa Claus gets a... a His choice of anything in the toy department? How did you know, Connie? (laughs) You just finished telling me, Mrs. Davis. (laughs) Oh, so I did. Now, where in the world did I put those letters? What have you...
you done to your car, Walter? Seems to have quite an air about it this morning. It's nothing but your own aromatic presence, Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, thanks, Walter, but I'm not what I mean. Wait a minute. Here's a cigar on the seat between us. Oh, probably dropped out of my dad's pocket. I drove him to work this morning. Hey, do you mind if I keep it? It might make a nice good morning gesture to Mr. Conklin. I can use one at this point. Oh, sure. My dad's got a pocket full of cigars. But what's wrong with you and old Marblehead? <laughs> Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Are you in the doghouse, Miss Brooks? Where I am shouldn't happen to a dog, Walter. <laughs> but maybe this little peace offering will help. Smells awfully sweet for a cigar. Oh, it isn't the cigar that has that sweet smell, Miss Brooks. That's Miss Enright. Where is she sitting? In the glove compartment? <laughs> no, I just dropped her off at the beauty parlor. She was wearing a new perfume. She said it was called Voodoo. Kind of clings to the upholstery, doesn't it? <laughs> just like Miss Enright. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Walter. I shouldn't speak that way about another member of the faculty. Forget I said anything. Oh, sure. I know there's no love lost between you two. Although, Miss Enright did pay you a rather nice compliment this morning. You did? Yes, ma'am. She said she thought it was wonderful how you taught the subject of English. Miss Enright said that? Just before she went into the beauty parlor. She said that anybody who could teach a language to so many kids for such a long time, in spite of her obvious difficulty in speaking that language, should get a medal. <laughs> Maybe the dryer will fall on her. <laughs> By the way, Walter, did Miss Enright mention her reason for going to the beauty parlor so early in the morning? Oh, come to think of it, she did. She said she was going out with Mr. Boynton after school. But today's Friday, the day Mr. Boynton usually takes me to the zoo. Well, it's also a special occasion for Miss Enright. It's her birthday. Can you know something, Miss Brooks? She came right out and told me her age. How old did she say she was, Walter? Twenty-seven. I guess that's why Mr. Boynton has to take her out today instead of you. I still don't see what Miss Enright's birthday has to do with it. He didn't take her out last year when she was 27. <laughs> or the year before when she was 28. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Miss Brooks. I seem to detect the presence of the green-eyed monster in this vehicle. She can't possibly be back from the beauty parlor yet. <laughs> oh, it just makes me mad, Walter, the way some women try to keep their ages hidden. Why, if anybody wanted to make it their business, they could find out my age in a minute. How old are you, Miss Brooks? None of your business. <laughs> There's Mr. Conklin going into his office, Miss Brooks. Now's your chance to slip in that cigar. Right, Walter. See you in class. Uh, good morning, Mr. Conklin. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Have a cigar? Cigar? Yes, sir. I just happen to have it on me. That is, a gentleman friend left it in my compact. Uh, here. It's brand new. No ink on it. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll withdraw to the safety of my office while I'm still ahead. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Goodbye. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, Miss Enright. Walter Denton tells me that today's your birthday. Why, well, yes, darling, it is. Happy birthday. <laughs> I shall bask in the warmth of that greeting all day. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Enright, but I don't think it's fair of you to make Mr. Boynton break a date with me just because it's your birthday. Oh, I didn't make him do anything, Miss Brooks. It's obviously a matter of preference. Put down a brightly colored gay silk scarf and an old gray shoe, and even a baby will reach for the scarf. Are you calling me an old gray shoe? <laughs> well, if it slips, darling, slip it on. <laughs> Now, look, Miss Enright, I don't want to be rude to you on this of all days, especially since I realize that your birthday is one holiday which has been celebrated in this neighborhood for countless generations. <laughs> but every Friday, Mr. Boynton takes me to the zoo. That's very cooperative, my dear, but if the zoo wants you badly enough, they'll come and get you. <laughs> now, you really must excuse me. I've got to find Walter Denton's car. I left a cigar in the front seat this morning. Oh, is that your cigar? I thought you smoked a pipe. <laughs> it's for Mr. Boynton. He's just a big, overgrown boy when it comes to practical jokes, you know, so I bought that cigar for him in the magic shop. In the magic shop? Yes. It's an exploding cigar. <laughs> Not dangerous, of course, just full of soot. Oh, no. Oh, excuse me, Miss Enright, but I've got to get back to Mr. Conklin's office right away. 
about that cigar I gave you, sir? Yes, Miss Brooks? Oh, God! <laughs> Mr. Carver, are you all right? Why, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm just dandy. <laughs> but there's soot all over my face. What do you suggest I do about that? What can you do, Mr. Conklin? Get down on one knee and sing April showers. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. Eminent dental authorities supervise hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate Dental Cream is directed, using Colgate's exclusively, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research shows decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst right after eating. Brushing teeth, it says directed, helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Yes, Colgate contains all the necessary ingredients including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. So remember, always use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Well, I finally convinced Mr. Conklin that the cigar episode should be included in my list of unpremeditated crimes. Then when lunch period dragged itself around, I hastened to the cafeteria to see if Miss Enright was with Mr. Boynton. She wasn't, so in four seconds flat, I was. <laughs> I waited all during lunch for him to break our date for that afternoon, but he remained strangely silent. So while we were drinking our coffee, I summoned all my feminine wiles and subtly remarked, Is I is or is I ain't your baby? <laughs> What did you say, Miss Brooks? Nothing, Mr. Boynton. Here's a napkin. It's just that I get a distinct feeling of guilt emanating from your side of the table. Uh, guilt? What makes you say that? You paid for my coffee. <laughs> it's all right. You can pay for mine next time. I paid for yours last time. We're even. <laughs> but today is Friday, Mr. Boynton. Is that right? That's right. And we usually go to the zoo on Friday. Isn't that so? Yes, that's so. Well? Well, what? Is I is or is I ain't your baby? If you mean am I keeping our engagement, Miss Brooks, well, a, a funny thing happened this morning. On your way to the rabbit's cage? <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, I was in my lab when it happened. I remembered an appointment I made for this afternoon with somebody else. Namely? My, uh, uh my grandmother. Uh, that's it. My, my grandmother came into town unexpectedly this morning, and I promised to take her out for the day. She's, uh, she's rather helpless, you see, because, well, she's quite far along in years. You're not just clacking your crockery, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> it so happens, Mr. Boynton, that I know your grandmother. Y you do? Yes, she's 27 years old, and she teaches English at Madison High School. Miss Brooks, I've decided that rather than stoop to deception, I'd better be honest about this thing. <laughs> What I told you just now about my grandmother, it isn't true. No. <laughs> no, I, I made a date with Miss Enright for today, but only because it's her birthday, Miss Brooks. She told me her folks were living in another part of the country. And... My folks live in another part of the country. Well, Miss Enright also said she didn't have too many friends. I don't have too many friends. But Miss Enright is 27 years old today. My folks live in another part of the country. <laughs> my, I'm sorry, Miss Brooks. I just didn't want your feelings to be hurt. Don't worry about my feelings, Mr. Boynton. I've sent away for a plastic set. Hi, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Harriet. How are you, Harriet? Would you care to sit down? There's plenty of room at this table. Oh, thanks just the same, Mr. Boynton, but I've got to take this container of coffee to Daddy. Oh, is your father lunching in his office, Harriet? Yeah. He says he's too embarrassed to eat in public today. There seems to be something on his neck he can't get off. The Board of Education? <laughs> it's some black stuff. 
He didn't want to talk about it too much. Here, Harriet, let me take that coffee down to him. Well, it's I... the least I can do. You sit here and chat with Mr. Boynton, dear. He's very good company today, loaded with stories. <laughs> well, all right, Miss Brooks, if you say so. Here's the coffee, and here's some extra sugar. Daddy likes it plenty sweet. Thanks, Harriet. I'll, uh, I'll see you later, won't I, Miss Brooks? As we both get older, you mean? <laughs> oh, please drop into my lab after school. Maybe we can work something out. Perhaps we can all have a date together. Fine. I'll bring my grandfather for Miss Enright. Come in. I, I met your daughter in the cafeteria, Mr. Conklin, and she gave me this coffee to bring you. What happened to her? Pulled up lame? <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I wanted to sort of atone for some of my earlier transgressions. Well, don't stand there. Pour some coffee in a cup for me, please. Yes, sir. I'll just get this cover off. It's on pretty tight. Well, I hope it's hot. If there's anything I can't stand, it's cool coffee. Oh, I'm sure it's piping hot, Mr. Conklin. I can tell by the way the container feels. Let, let, me, let me help you. No, it's coming now. I'll... Oh! Is piping hot. Is <laughs> Observe the steam rising from my trousers. Where you're sitting. <laughs> Miss Brooks, yesterday you dipped my cigar in the inkwell. This morning you gave me one that exploded in my face. And now, thanks to you again, a container of hot coffee is running down my leg. <laughs> well, don't. Stand there, Miss Brooks. What have you to say for yourself? Is it sweet enough, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> if it isn't Miss Brooks, come in. <laughs> I said come in. So you are out, good Conklin. I am. And no doubt you heard of Bush's department store. I have. Well, I'm Bush. I'm a little pooped myself. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be brief, Mr. Conklin. Each year, my store gives away contest prizes to children who write in the best letters to Santa Claus. And we like to choose some prominent citizens in our community to play Santa for this occasion. Hence, my visit here. Uh, my dear Mr. Bush, if you're suggesting that I involve myself in the squalling clamor of hundreds of children in a department store, put it out of your mind. But, Mr. Conklin... Uh, you we... have no way of knowing this, of course, but I'm a person with extremely high blood pressure and acute hypertension. Playing Santa to a band of yowling brats is out of the question. But I've invited all the photographers and reporters, Mr. Conklin. You'll get, at the very least, a two-column picture in every paper. I'm sorry. It's absolutely unthinkable for me to... 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 Uh, two-column picture? <laughs> of course. You see, we've picked a winning letter, and you're the ideal choice to present the grand prize this afternoon. Why me? Because you're a school principal. And the contest winner is a little seven-year-old girl who wants to be a teacher when she grows up. <laughs> a teacher? Well, I guess I can arrange it. I'd hate to disappoint a child, especially this obviously backward little tyke. <laughs> what time shall I be there, Mr. Bush? Uh, four o'clock sharp, please. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. You're welcome, I'm sure. Now, if you'll excuse me, sir, I must inspect some new gym equipment that just arrived. Of course, Miss Carter. Oh, before I leave your office, may I use the phone? Uh, certainly. Right there on my desk. I'll see you at four, Mr. Bush. All right, thank you. Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> Hello. Oh, this is Mr. Bush of Bush's department store. My secretary gave me your phone number, Miss Davis. Told me what a grand job you've done of rounding up the children's letters in our Letters to Santa contest. I was glad to help, Mr. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Now, there's just one bit of information I need from you. Do you know where, uh, Connie Brooks lives? Connie Brooks? Certainly. She lives right here with me. Well, that's a coincidence. Could I speak with her? Not now. She's still in school. <laughs> oh, of course. It's not three o'clock yet. As a matter of fact, I was just getting ready to pick her up. One of the students in school with her usually takes her home, but he's busy today. I see. Well, Miss Davis, you can do me a great favor. Instead of taking her home today, bring Connie right over to our store. What for? You'll see. What kind of toys does she favor, Mrs. Davis? Toys. Connie doesn't play with toys. Oh, the serious type, eh? <laughs> well, 
Bring her over as early as you can, Mrs. Davis, so I can get acquainted with her. She'll probably warm up a bit after a nice romp in the sand pile. <laughs> now, remember, Mrs. Davis, don't tell her why she's coming to the store. I'd like it to be a surprise. It'll be a surprise, all right. <laughs> Now, will you please tell me what we're doing in Bush's department store, Mrs. Davis? I haven't enough money left to buy a Christmas seal, let alone do any shopping. Be patient, Connie. We'll find out as soon as I can locate Mr. Bush. I know. Let's cut out for the sand pile. It's right over there in the toy department. All right, but I... Oh, look, there's Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Excuse me just a moment, won't you? I'll go on ahead, Connie, and find Mr. Bush. Fine, Mrs. Davis. Well, Mr. Boynton, doing a little last-minute Christmas shopping? Oh, not exactly, Miss Brooks. Miss Enright asked me to come over here right after school. She's uh, she's crazy about children, she says, and they're having some sort of contest here today. Where is she now? Oh, she's in the hardware department picking up a new roaster. She says next to children, she likes nothing better than cooking and housework. I bet she's terribly decent to animals, too. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I didn't see you after school, but Miss Enright insisted we leave at once. After all, it is... Her birthday today, I know, Mr. Boynton. I I had a hunch you two would wind up alone. Oh, we're only going to a movie, Miss Brooks. Donald O'Connor and Francis just opened at the state. It's the story of an army mule. Oh? That's where you're taking Miss Enright? That's right. What are you trying to do? Start your own mule train? <laughs> I just got the most charming part, darling. Oh, you've acquired one of your own, haven't you, Mr. Boyd? <laughs> Hello, Prudence. <laughs> Cooked any interesting children lately? <laughs> please, ladies, please, let's get over to the toy department. They're getting ready for the ceremonies. The spotlight was just turned on that platform. Oh, fine, Mr. Boynton. I just adore toys. Well, why don't you act your age? <laughs> Come along, Miss Brooks. I see Mrs. Davis right in the front row. Attention, attention. Quiet, please, children. Quiet, children. Quiet. Here, without further ado, is your old friend Santa Claus. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Merry Christmas, kiddies. Why, that's Mr. Conklin. Is it really? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> of course. I'd recognize that bloodthirsty cheerfulness anywhere. <laughs> Here you are, Santa. Here's the prize winning letter in the contest. I suppose you read it out loud and will surprise the author who I know is among those listening. Surely, surely. <gasps> It says, Dear Sandy Claus, spelled C L A W S S S. That's nice. One S for each claw. <laughs> I don't want you to bring me very much toys at all, because then you would not have enough for all the other little children. Isn't she a doll? <laughs> Wait a minute. This sounds awfully familiar. Please, Sandy, just bring me a slate with some chalk and a eraser and some crayons and a ruler, because when I grow up, I want to be a English teacher. Oh, no. I'm Connie Brooks, age seven. Now, if this little girl will step up... this girl, Mr. Conklin. Now, let's get her up to the platform. Where are you, honey? You, Mr. Bush, down here. I'm Mrs. Davis. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. The girl you're looking for is standing right here beside me. What? Who are you? I'm Connie Brooks, age seven. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what's the meaning of this? Yes. What is this hoax? Oh, there was no hoax intended, gentlemen. Mrs. Davis must have absentmindedly put my letter in with the other kids. When I wrote that letter, I was actually seven years old. You were never that young, darling. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. The press and photographers will be here any minute. Give me that bag of toys, Mr. Conklin. This girl gets nothing. Now, hold on there, Mr. Bush. The contest rules clearly state that the winner must be a child. If Miss Brooks was seven years old when she wrote that letter, she, she's entitled to take home anything she wants from the toy department. Yes. I think you've got something there, Mr. Boynton. Oh, uh, this is terribly embarrassing. Miss Brooks, if you'll just leave the premises before the press arrive, you may have anything in the toy department you desire. What do you want? Uh, Mr. Bush, this is Mr. Boynton. Wrap him up. <laughs> Eve 
Steve Arden returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Luster cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, luster cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a luster cream shampoo. So gentle, luster cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight? Yes, tonight, try luster cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. You're your crowning glory too. A luster cream shampoo. And now once again, here is Eve Arden. This Christmas, give yourself and your family the gift that keeps on giving. United States savings bonds, the present with the future. And buy savings bonds regularly. Start preparing now for those things you know you're going to want and need in the future. If you're on a regular payroll, use the easy payroll savings plan. If you're self-employed, use the bond a month plan. Invest today in security. Your own economic security and the security of your country. Buy United States savings bonds today. <laughs> Next week, turn into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo, the soft, glamorous, caressable hair, and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Mary Jane Croft, and Hal March. <laughs> Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Tom Olive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Tom Olive Brushless Way to Shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Tom Olive Brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves, the proved Tom Olive Brushless Way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting fun fact adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evening over most of these same stations, and be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Jack Benny Program, transcribed, presented by Lucky Strike. Friends, every time you light up a Lucky, you get more real deep down smoking enjoyment. Yes, that's exactly what you get from every Lucky you light. For to make certain that Luckies are a smoother, lighter, more deeply enjoyable smoke, Luckies pay more for fine tobacco, millions of dollars more than official parity prices. Remember, in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine tobacco that guarantees a milder, truly finer cigarette for you. Yes, from first puff to last, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky. So for your own real deep-down smoking enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. <laughs> Program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Sportcat, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Beverly Hills. It's morning, and hundreds of people brimming with the Christmas spirit are waiting for the local department store to open its doors. Oh, Mary. Mary, where are you? Here I am, Jack, right behind you. Oh, yeah. Say, Mary, how'd you like the way I wiggled myself through this crowd, right up to the front of the line? Yeah. Those rumble lessons you took from Arthur Murray really helped. I'll say. 
When we started, we were way at the end, and now there's only one man ahead of me. Hello, Jack. Hello, Mr. Murray. <laughs> Oh, look, look, Mary, they're getting ready to open the store and let the crowd in. I can see the manager walking over to the floor, Walker. Jasper, what is it, Mr. Simpkins? It's almost time to open the store. Are all the clerks at their station? Yes, sir. Good. You will open the doors in ten seconds. Are you ready for final inspection? Yes, sir. Hair? Comb. Chin? Out. Jacket? Crest? Carnation? Moist. Good. (laughs) It is now nine o'clock. You may open the doors and guide our customers into the store. Yes, sir. Mule train! Jasper, how could you do a thing like that to our customers? When I saw those faces, I couldn't control myself. (laughs) Wait here, Mary. I'll be right back. Jack, don't get into it. Never mind. Say, mister, are you the manager? Uh, Yes, I am. Well, as one of your steady customers, I resent being ushered into the store like a mule. I apologize, sir. I've never been... I said, I apologize. Put your ears down. Now, look, mister... Jack, I told you not to get into it. Come on. Oh, all right. Jack, I'd like to go to a store with you just once where you don't get into an argument with everybody. Look, Mary, I'll admit that sometimes it may be my fault, but not this time. Imagine driving customers into a store yelling mule train. Well, don't stand there complaining. Go have your coat fixed. My coat? His whip tore your sleeve off. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, I'll just pin it and then fix it when I get home. Come on. Mary, what do you think I ought to get for my sister Florence in Chicago? Oh, I don't know. It ought to be something nice. You know, Mary, I have no brothers and no other sister. Florence is my only close relative. I ought to get her something really nice. Uh, what'd you get her last year? A pencil sharpener. <laughs> oh, how sweet, Jack. But then she is your only sister. Yeah. <laughs> After all, you know... Jack, let's go outside and come in the store again. Why? I want that guy with a whip to get another crack at you. <laughs> Nothing doing. He had his chance. Anyway, I can't understand a store like this bringing customers in just the way... Hey, they... pardon me, mister. Did you see my wife? Huh? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Did you see my wife? No, I haven't. As a matter of fact, I don't even know your wife. Then how do you know you didn't see her? <laughs> Now, mister, how would I know... I can't stand here jabbering. i better go look for her. Chloe! <laughs> now, come on, Mary. Let's Oh, go. Jack, look. There's Dennis. Where? Oh, yes. Hey, young man, what can I do for you? Gee, I don't know what to get for my mother. She goes horseback riding a lot. Maybe she'd like it if I buy something for the horse. Well, say, mister... Yes? How much is that horse collar? Horse collar? Yes, that white one hanging up there on the wall. Young man, this is the plumbing department. (laughs) Just what is it you're looking for? I don't know, but I'd like to get something for my mother. Well, I can call the ladies' department and save you some time. Did you have anything in mind? Yes, sir. I think a dress would be nice. Oh, that's an excellent idea. What size dress does your mother wear? 36. 36? Uh Uh-huh. I think I ought to get her a nightgown, too. Size 58. Now, wait a minute, son. If your mother wears a 36 dress, why would she wear a 58 nightgown? She doesn't sleep in her girdle. (laughs) Young man, young man, I think you're a little confused. However, I will admit there is a little variation in size, but very slight. Gee, I hope that movie company doesn't find out. Movie company? Yeah, they want my mother to take off her girdle to advertise their new picture. What picture? Lost Boundaries. Young man, would you do me a favor and shoplift something so I can have you arrested? What? Yeah, let it go. Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh-huh. Those men's shirts in that case across the aisle, are they real silk? Oh, yes, they are. They'd make a wonderful gift for your father. Oh, they're not for my father. I'd like to buy them for Jack Benny. Jack Benny? Do you know him? Oh, sure. He's on one of my shows. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mr. 
Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Doing your Christmas shopping? Yeah. Gee, I was just going to decide on Mr. Benny's gift, and he had to walk up and spoil the whole thing. Oh, I'm sorry, kid. I, I didn't know you wanted to be a secret. Yeah. Now you'll have to close your eyes. Okay. Got them closed? Uh-huh. Okay, mister, you can wrap it up now and put it in a shoebox so he won't know it's a shirt. <laughs> Can I open my eyes now? Yeah. Gee, that was a close one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, say, Mr. Benny, while my packages are being gift wrapped, would you like to step over to the music counter and hear a record I just made? Oh, sure, kid. Come on. Oh, miss? Yes? Do you have the latest record made by Dennis Day? You mean I must have done something wonderful? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, would you play it, miss? I'm sorry, but our record player is broken. Broken? Yeah, all day yesterday, every five minutes, some curly-headed jerk kept requesting, that's what I like about the South. <laughs> I think I know who you mean. Uh, why didn't you tell him that you refused to play it? And get hit with a ham hock? <laughs> oh, yes, he's never without one. Gee, and I wanted you to hear my record. Well, it'll make you feel better, Dennis. You sing and I'll spin you around. Eh? Okay. Okay, come on. Dennis, I'll bet it's a swell record. Say, Mary, don't you think that song will be a... Mary? Now, where did Mary go? Well, she's way over there at the end of the counter. Oh, yeah. May I uh, wait on you, miss? Yes, sir. I'd like to get something for a gentleman. A gentleman? Your uh, husband? Uh, no, my boss. He's been nice to me, and I'd like to show my appreciation. Oh, here's something nice. A gold tie clasp. A gold tie clasp? No. Well, how about a gold keychain? No. How about gold cufflinks? Look, mister, I don't want to get him anything. He can melt down. <laughs> Gee, I wish I could think of something. Well, miss, perhaps I could help you better if you told me how closely you two are associated. Are, uh, are you engaged? Uh, no, we're not. Is he your boyfriend? No, as a matter of fact, he treats me more like a sister. How about a pencil sharpener? <laughs> Oh, 
A pencil sharpener? Yes, we ship one to Chicago every year. <laughs> it goes to a girl named Flossie. Uh, you mean Florence? Well, I feel like I know her. <laughs> hey, Mary. Mary, let's not keep losing each other. Yeah, I spend more... Oh, than... hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, hello. It's uh, on the way to Chicago. So, uh, wait a minute. This year, I was going to get my sister something different. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go. You know, it's amazing how everybody knows I'm a comedian. <laughs> Mary, I'm going to get something else for my sister. Now, is there anything else, sir? Well, I don't know, baby. Uh, let's see what I bought so far. Well, there's one black negligee. Yeah. <laughs> That's for my ever-loving wife. Oh, you're, you're married? Am I married? Why, I'm married to Alice Faye, the sweetest <laughs> little gal who ever... Oh, come on now, baby. Stop crying. There ain't enough of me for everybody. <laughs> Happens every time. <laughs> now, let's see, honey. I've got everybody's present except one for Jackson. Oh, I know. I'll, I'll get him a pair of socks. What size? Uh, Eleven and a half. These? Yeah. Now, I'll just take off my shoes, put the new ones on, and then I'll be Mr. over... Mr. Harris, I thought you were going to give socks to Mr. Benny. I am. Here are my old ones. Gift wrap them. <laughs> Don't you want me to sew up the holes first? No, no, no. Just throw in a needle and thread. And give the old man something to do when he gets home from his rumble lesson. <laughs> yeah, put plenty of ribbon on the box so the kids can oh, play around. Hey, Phil. Well, dear hearts and gentle people. <laughs> Funny running into you, Phil. Yeah, how's Alice? Now stop it. <laughs> What's the matter with her? The usual thing. She's upset because she found out I'm married. Oh, now, that's ridiculous. You cried a little too, Dad. <laughs> all right, all right. But that was during the ceremony. It had nothing to do with you. Well, then why'd you cry? Because you wouldn't let him go on the honeymoon. <laughs> Sorry, stop. I've seen that. Right, Jackson, I've got to finish my shopping, kids. Look, I've got to get some uh, California pennants. California pennants? Yeah, you see, I'm going to the Rose Bowl game, and I want to cheer for California. But all they got in this store are pennants from Syracuse. Pennants from Syracuse? Sure, there's a big box of them right up there on the counter. See what it says? Syracuse pennants. That circus peanut. <laughs> Syracuse pennants. Phil, how can you be... He disappeared in the crowd. Good, good. Now, Mary, I wish you'd help me decide on something for my sister, Florence. Well, Jack, I've been trying to think. Gosh, I don't know. Hey, mister, are you sure you didn't see my wife? Uh, look, buddy, I'd like to help you, but I don't know what your wife looks like. Has she got any identifying marks? Well, she's got a birthmark on... Never mind, I'll look for her myself. <laughs> yes, yes, you better. Hello, Come on, Mary. Why does everybody have to pick on me? Well, have you made up your mind, sir? Huh? Oh! Oh, I was just looking around. I sure would like to give my girl a ring like that. Well, I don't blame you. That's a beautiful diamond ring. Uh, how much is it? $4,000. That doesn't sound so bad. Uh, where do I look in my bank book? Hmm. Well? Uh, where do I turn the page? <laughs> Well? Uh, well, I turn another page. Hmm. Well? Uh, just a minute, I'm on the last page. Well, what's on the last page? Put something in the pot, boy. <laughs> well, look, mister, if you want to buy this ring, you don't have to pay the $4,000 cash. You can pay for it on easy terms. All you have to do is establish credit rating. Uh, credit rating? Yes, I have the forms right here. Your name? Uh, Rochester Van Jones. Are you employed? Yes, sir. Who do you work for? Jack Benny. Oh. What are your duties? You mean you want to go on? <laughs> Why, yes. What are your duties with Mr. Benny? Well, besides being his rumble partner, 
I'm a personal secretary, legal advisor, attorney at law, and I also select the scripts for the movies he makes. You pick his movies? He has to blame somebody. <laughs> well, I don't agree with you. I think that Mr. Benny is a great entertainer, whether it's stage, screen, or radio. And as far as I'm concerned, his last picture was one of the funniest I've ever seen. You keep talking like that, you'll be in line for a pencil sharpener. <laughs> Jack, I think Rochester's is over there picking out a gift for you. Yeah, I guess so. I don't want to see, him see me, so let's move on. Oh, Jack! Jack! Hey, it's Don! Hello, Don. Why, hello, Mary. Oh, say, Jack, I just bought you a present, but I felt it was silly to wait until Christmas, so I'm going to give it to you now. Here. For me? A mop? But, Don, what can I do with a mop? This isn't a mop. I just put a handle on it so you wouldn't be embarrassed carrying it home. <laughs> Oh, I see. I thought the widow's peak was so you could get into the corners. <laughs> John, John, what have you got in that little bag? Oh, Mary, I'm glad you asked me. Here, here, I'll show it to you. It's the cutest thing you ever saw. What is it, Don? Well, see, it's a little toy merry-go-round. Well, what do you want that for? Well, now, here, let me show you. First, you wind it up. And then you release the lever, and it spins around and plays music. Really? Let's see how it works, Don. Okay. L-S-M-F-T Lucky Strike is as good as can be L-S-M-F-T Smoke a Lucky and you will soon see shopping to do, so I'll meet you there later. All right, Mary. Don't be too long. Yeah, what kind of perfume I ought to get? Oh, there you are. What? Where is she? <laughs> oh. oh, for heaven's sake. Why do you keep asking me about your wife? I told you I don't know what she looks like. Well, here. I'll show you a picture of her. See? This? <laughs> this is your wife? Yep. <laughs> Seems silly of me to keep looking for her, don't it? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, miss, she must be in the store someplace, so just keep looking and you'll probably find her. I hope not. <laughs> Come on, Rube. Rube? Call me. Oh. I'd like to get out of here so I can stop running into such silly... Oh, here's a perfume counter. Must be something nice here for my sister. Oh, clerk. Her. Uh, what can I do for you, sir? <laughs> hmm. Are you the salesman here? Yeah. 
You're the salesman here in the perfume department? Don't take my word for it. Smell me. <laughs> I'll, I'll take your word for it. Thank you. Yeah. Now, what kind of perfume would you like to buy? Well, what kind have you got? I've got taboo, temptation, shocking, white shoulders, surrender, and you should excuse the expression, my sin. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think, I think my sister likes taboo, but I don't know whether to get it for her or not. <laughs> taboo or not taboo, that is the question. <laughs> hmm. I made that up myself. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Everybody says I'm another Milton Boyle. <laughs> Your, your face. <laughs> your face does look a little like a kinescope. <laughs> now, let's, uh, let's see some other perfumes, please. Okay. We have some very nice imported ones. Evening in Paris. Uh-huh. Midnight in Madrid. Uh-huh. Here's a domestic one. Morning in the Smog. <laughs> Oh, are they, are they bottling it now? Why not? We got enough of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, there you are, Dad. Yeah, I thought I'd stop here and get some perfume for Florence. Clerk, what's that? Oh, this is a very fashionable odor. It's called Eau Jude Oui. I'll spray a little on you. Say, that does smell nice. Yeah. And it's got penicillin in it to fight off virus X. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, you know. You... Say, Jack, here's a perfume your sister Florence might like. L'eau de la vie crayon. L'eau de la vie crayon. What does that mean? Aroma of freshly sharpened pencil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're no help. Imagine putting a clerk like you behind a perfume counter. Oh, this ain't my regular job. I just sell perfume during the Christmas rush. I thought so. What is your regular job? I'm a goose girl at Hollywood Park. <laughs> oh, come on, Mary. I've had enough of this guy. Hey, what's that? Well, we've been here all day, and it's closing time. You mean they're closing the store now? Yes. Jack, look out! You're afraid of here! Darn it, there goes my other sleeve. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, care food packages have been improved and increased with more meats and fats that mean health to hungry children and families overseas. Twenty-two and one-half pounds of life-giving food for $10. Delivery guaranteed. Send your contribution to Nonprofit Care, Los Angeles or New York. That's C A R E, Care, Los Angeles or New York. <laughs> Jack, we'll be back in just a moment, but first. When Lucky Strike goes to the tobacco markets, they have you in mind. Your deep down enjoyment of smoking. And that's a big reason why they pay more for fine tobacco. <laughs> Yes, friends, at the tobacco auctions, Lucky Strike pays millions of dollars, more than official parity prices, for fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. You see, in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And LSMFT, Lucky Strike, means fine tobacco. You'll know this is true with every Lucky you like. For here's smoking at its finest. Smooth, mellow, deeply enjoyable. There's never a rough puff in a Lucky. And like you, the veteran tobacco men choose Lucky Strike for their own personal enjoyment. In fact, a recent survey reveals that more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen, smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So take a tip from the experts 
and smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. And here's a Christmas gift suggestion that every friend will welcome. A specially wrapped Christmas carton of Lucky Strike cigarettes. Ten packs, 200 cigarettes. 200 wonderfully smooth, deeply enjoyable Luckies. Yes, give Lucky Strike Christmas cartons to your friends. And keep a good supply of Luckies on hand to add to your enjoyment of the Christmas season. Gee, Mary, this Christmas rush is awful, isn't it? Yes. Hey, look how crowded this bus is. Hey, Ruth! Ruth! Huh? How are you? Oh, it's you. I'm fine, fine. You ever find your wife? Who do you think is driving the bus? <laughs> oh, well, tell Chloe to let me off at the next corner. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday, two hours before my own show on the same network, the Actors' Company will present The Man Who Came to Dinner with Charles Boyer, Mel Farrar, Henry Fonda, John Garfield, Gene Kelly, Dorothy McGuire, Gregory Peck, Rosalind Russell, and yours truly, Jack Betty. I'm sure you'll enjoy the show. And another thing, ladies and gentlemen, the next time we meet, it will be Christmas Day. So on behalf of my sponsor, my cast, my entire staff, I want to take this opportunity to wish each and every one of you a happy and joyous holiday season. Be sure to hear Dennis Day in the day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy show, which follows immediately. Coca-Cola brings you Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy. Sunday night, and time again for Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy. With Mortimer Sturd and Ray Noble in his orchestra, and the Mellow Man brought to you each week by the Coca-Cola Company. Tonight's special guest is the lovely lady of the screen, Miss June Allison. And now, Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy. I, I know, I know, honey, but I gotta hang up now, my kumquat. Yes. Well, they've announced me. Charlie, get off that telephone. Yeah. Did you get your allowance, babe? Oh, good. Now you can take me out tonight. Really, Charlie? So long, my tangerine. I'll be squeezing you. <laughs> Charlie, I just couldn't help overhearing your conversation. Why? Was the extension phone caught in your ear? No, no. no. <laughs> I can't believe that you talk to a girl that way. Who is she? Well, let's just say she's a good skate for what pays the freight. Oh, I see. <laughs> I can't understand this younger generation. Why, when I was growing up, everybody was a gentleman. You mean there weren't any women at all? Oh. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I mean, we acted like gentlemen. Oh, Apparently, you don't know what a gentleman is. Oh, sure. A gentleman is a wolf with patience. All right. <laughs> Charlie, next... Well... <laughs> next time you see this girl of yours... Yes? Yeah. Why don't you try... Try talking about music and art and... Uh, why don't you quote poetry? Oh, no, no. 
No, I tell you, Bergen, girls don't take that kind of punishment today. Oh, they don't. <laughs> well, you just try it and see what she does. I know what she'll do. She'll conk me on the head with her baseball bat. Yeah. Her baseball bat? Yes, yeah, sure. She's homicida Ida. Oh, she is? Yes. She's the catcher on our baseball team. Oh, some girl. You can say it, yes. Strong as an ox. Yeah. And twice as pretty. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, times have changed. Yeah. Charlie, I want to remind you that June Allison is coming by to see us, and I wish, for me, I wish you'd remember your party manners. Did you say June Allison? Yes. <gasps> oh. <laughs> now, there is my big moment. Yes. Yeah. You know, she's just as cute as a button. Yes. Now, well, I'd like to get my button hooks on her. All right. <laughs> I want you to think of yourself as a gallant knight and conduct yourself as uh, one of King Arthur's men. Now, those were wonderful days. Were you happy then, Bergen? Oh, I wasn't born then. Oh, oh look, I see June Allison headed this way. Oh, my heart is turning a handspring. Here we are, Junie. Hello, Edgar. Hello, Charlie. Oh. Uh, Junie, it's it's good to see you. Yeah, we were just talking about romance and chivalry, you know. Uh, uh, tell me, uh, do you feel uh, do you feel uh, spoony, Junie? <laughs> that I do, Goonie. <laughs> all right, all right, June. I was telling Charlie if he would conduct himself as a knight of King Arthur's time, he would be the most popular boy at school. You are absolutely right, Edna. I'm sure everyone would think that... Think, think that I was nuts. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Hmm? It would not fit in with our times. But I would have adored living in those days with all the knights in their shining armor. Well, what was so great about that? Well, it would have been so much fun shopping for hand goods. Why? Well, in those days, even the men were put up in tins. Oh. <laughs> Jude. <laughs> You're ashamed, aren't you, now? <laughs> Told you not to say. <laughs> Soon I remember seeing you in the MGM picture. Uh, what was the name of that MGM picture? Men put up in tins. No, no, no. <laughs> that one will live to haunt you. All right. <laughs> Oh, I know, that picture, words and music, you know, where you did a very clever little scene. It was two knights in armor, and you sang, uh, Thou Swell or something. Yes, yeah. that's right. It was about a knight making love to his lady pair. Yeah. Yeah, with a modern touch. Yeah, I, remember, I remember that. It, 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 I know how the song goes. It goes, uh, Thou Swell. No, 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 no Charlie, it goes like this. You're interrupting me. <laughs> thou Swell, Thou Witty, Thou Sweet. Thou grand would kiss me pretty, would hold my hand, both thine eyes would kiss me, what they do to me. Hear me, holler, I choose a sweet holler, but loser me. I feel so rich in a hutch for two, two rooms and kitchen, I'm sure would do. Give me just a plot of, not a lot of land, and thou swell, thou witty, thou grand. Thou swell, thou witty, thou sweet, thou grand, would kiss me pretty, would hold my hand, but fine eyes are cute too, what they do to me. I choose a sweet lover, but loser can be. Oh, my sweet lover, but loser, I feel so rich in the tiny little front that I for two. Two rooms and kitchen, I'm sure would do. Give me just a pot of, not a lot of land. And I swear, how witty, the grand. How do you like my voice, Charlie? Well, I think it's very... Yeah, well, so do I. I've been told that I have the range of Lily Pons and the vivacity of Mary Martin. 
Do you think so? Well, I... Well, I don't think so either. Uh, no. Uh, do, do you know, you know, you've got me kind of interested in that King Arthur stuff. You know? Say, I have an idea, Charlie. Yeah? The museum has a wonderful display in their armor room. Let's go and see it. Now, that is a splendid idea. Now, you two go ahead and I'll meet you at the museum. Mortimer, how do you find yourself these days? Well, most of the days I just don't bother to. I... <laughs> I'm, I'm on my way to the museum with Charlie. Well? Yes. Listen. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Have you ever been there? Uh, where? To the museum. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> How did you like it? The what? The museum. Oh, the museum. Well, I reckon it'll be all right when they get all that junk cleaned out of there. <laughs> what did you enjoy most at the museum? The sliding down the long banister out front. Look at the All right, all right. I mean, what did you get from your visit? Splinter, splinter, as I mean. <laughs> Well, now, you might get something more out of it if you come along with us. Uh, you know, I understand the museum is adding a new wing. Well, oh, that won't do much good. Why? They'll never get it off the ground. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you come with us and go through the museum again? No, no, no. I ain't never going there no more. No, no, no. Oh, yes, you will. Oh, no, I don't think I will. Wild, wild horse radishes couldn't drag me. Exactly. <laughs> What's wrong with the museum? Oh, it's too dangerous. Last time I was there, I seen a fellow that was hurt so bad that they had him bandaged from his head clear down to... <laughs> from his head down to, uh, Oh, you know, down to those, uh... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> from his head down to... Oh, what is the name of those things that live in shoes? Oh. Feet? Yeah, yeah, that's close enough. I guess. <laughs> Well, what about it? Well, this poor fellow looked like he was blindfolded all over. Is that so? Yeah. Well, now, wait a minute, Mortimer. Just where did you see this bandaged-up man? Well, he was leaning against the wall in the... in the gypsy section. You mean in the Egyptian section? Well, that's what I said, wasn't it? All right. Yeah. I talked to him, but... Uh, his mind, you know, is a little wandering, I see. <laughs> I tried to get his mind off his injuries, but he was kind of closed mouth. He, was. <laughs> he didn't say much. No, he didn't say much. Nope, no, didn't say much at all. <laughs> Conversation sort of drug, a drug. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mortimer, you were talking to a mummy. I was? Yes, yes. Well, I just wanted to help him. I know, I know. But I'm afraid you were too late to help him. About 4,000 years too late. Well, I got there as soon as I could. <laughs> Mortimer, I'm trying to tell you that that bandaged man, that bandaged man is completely ossified. Well, can you blame him for taking a nip like that? Taking a nip? Yeah. To sort of blunt the pain? Blunt the pain, yeah. <laughs> Well, he was in no pain because he was dead. Now, let me explain about mummies. After they were prepared and wrapped, they were put in a tomb, and lots of food was buried with them. Yeah? Yes. Well, now, you know, I, I reckon it ain't so bad being dead if you still got your appetite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was merely a custom. Now, do you feel that, that you know a little more about that bandage man? Oh, sure. I know him real well now. We'll... Have lots to talk about as soon as he can have visitors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How can you be so stupid? Well, who cares as long as it gets results? I don't care. <laughs> Speaking for your host of the airwaves, the Coca-Cola Company, let me remind you that the Coca-Cola dispenser at Soda Fountains is host to Thirsty Main Street the country over, inviting Christmas shoppers everywhere 
to pause and shop refreshed. Yeah, well, now there's June waiting on the steps of the museum, but no sign of Charlie. Well, I might have known he'd be late. Uh, uh, here I am, June. Uh, have you have you been here long? No, I just got here, Edgar. Oh, did you have any trouble finding the museum? No, day, day, day. Oh, <laughs> just got through with him, June. <laughs> I think Charlie went in ahead of us. Well, why did he go in ahead? Well, the doorman said a little boy asked him where he could find the statue of Lady Godiva. That's that's Charlie. That's my boy. <laughs> well, let's go in and find him. No, I wonder which way it is to the armor room. Oh, Fran. Oh. Hello. Francis. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Ursula Twing, Fran. Uh, your, simmer, simmer down. Uh, I'm your, your friendly uh, museum guy. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Thank you. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, my motto, please, my motto is, I tour it with a smile if the tip is worthwhile. <laughs> We're interested in the armor the knights used to wear. Could you show us through that room? Well, I could, but heavens to Elizabeth, it's way over on the other side. So? So, uh, would you rather stay here and kind of look at our exhibit of old bones? No, I don't. Well, they're just chock full of interest and calcium. <laughs> Why don't you take us to the armor room? Well, mainly because my feet hurt. No, oh, bad just... feet, yeah. What? Bad feet? No, not... I've got good feet. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I forgot to bring my corn plasters today, though I don't know why. I usually keep some on hand. Oh, on hand. <laughs> On hand, I Well, not exactly on hand either, but I usually keep them on the feet. <laughs> We're only interested in the armor. Well, please, won't you please look at my bones instead, Fran? Uh, see those uh, the huge uh, prehistoric ones over there? Yeah. Looky, looky. Uh, one bone is over 15 feet long. Mm. An explorer dug it up. My goodness. Think of the size of the prehistoric dog that buried it. <laughs> You're awful cute. I just knew that you folks would enjoy my lecture on bones once I got my teeth into it. Are you an authority on such things? Authority? Am I an authority? For heaven's sake, I'll have you know that I've got brains. I'm not just a pretty face. That's... <laughs> that is very true. Uh, very true. Yeah. What you said about prehistoric times was very interesting. Do you know much about the lost races? Do I know? Oh, my... Last season, I didn't win a single race at Santa Anita. <laughs> Is there any chance that you might condescend to show us the armor room? No, 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 no. Don't be in such a hurly-burly, Curly. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be just, just happy, very happy to take you there if you'll carry me piggyback. Fine guy, you are too weak to walk. But no. you think I'm a weakling just because my feet hurt. You're sadly mistaken. All right, so I made a mistake. Yes, you made a mistake. And not only that, but you pulled a terrible, if you'll pardon the expression, bloomer. Oh, it's... <laughs> I'm sure you're very strong, but we did come here to see the armor. Well, why must you always rush and hurry around and make everybody nervous? You can go right across the hall to the American Indian room and, and see Standing Bull. Isn't that Sitting Bull? No, the floors over there are so cold. <laughs> come on, June. We'll find the armor room ourselves. All right, go on. I didn't like your attitude in the first place. It just got me in such, such a snit anyway that if I was not 100% American, I'd be seeing red. Go on, go on. Goodbye, aye, aye. <laughs> Let's see now. Oh, there, there's the armor room right across the corridor, June. Oh, yes. And Charlie's waiting for it. Hello, June. Oh, I always knew you were beautiful, but standing next to Bergen, you're, you're positively gorgeous. Well, thank you, Charlie. And you too, Edgar. Yeah. <laughs> Just look at this medieval display. Yes, isn't that an impressive armor, that suit there? Oh, it's wonderful material. Sort of a galvanized gabardine. <laughs> I wonder how they had their suits pressed in those days. Yeah, I bet the laundries tore their bolts off the shirts. <laughs> well, according to the legend of King Arthur, the noble knights performed many feats of daring do for their ladies' fair. And from all over Britain, they came to Camelot to earn their seats at the round. <laughs> His Majesty, King Arthur. Greetings, brave knights. Take thy seats at the round table. <laughs> Sir Lancelot, methinks thou dost look handsome in thy new suit of armor. Thanks, Your Majesty. I have it a new tailor, Sir Henry of Ford. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I've heard his slogan, Watch the Pants Go By. <laughs> 
Uh, my suit looketh a bit rusty. but thinks it needs a lube job. Yeah. Tonight I shall go out and get oiled. <laughs> Really, thou must mend thy ways. It looketh bad for a knight at the round table to spend all his nights at the pool table. No. Oh, <laughs> I said that was a jest, methinks. <laughs> thou certainly do it. So, what is this? Oh, oh, not here. Oh, oh, yeah. What cometh near, my good Merlin? Sire, a group of strolling players approaches. <laughs> oh, uh, that is to say, Owen. How now, good players? What cook it? Hello, gentlemen. I hope you blokes are in the mood for some times and music. Blimey, I really hope so. Sounds, thou art a comely tomato. <laughs> what hast thou in yon basket? Coconuts, your highness. They're part of the game. Special they are, and only a penny a pitch. Would you like to hear more about it, gentlemen? I tell us more, me love. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. coconuts. There they are, standing in the row. Big ones, small ones, some as big as your head. Give them a twist to flicker the rest, that's what a showman said. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. coconuts. Every one you throw will make you rich. Make you rich. There stands me wife, the idol of me life, a sing and roll a bell, a ball, a penny a pitch. Sing and roll a bowl a ball a penny a bit. A roll a bowl a. Sing roll a bowl a ball a penny a bit. A roll a bowl a bowl a. Roll a bowl a ball. A roll a bowl a ball. Sing and roll a bowl a ball a penny a bit. Why don't you roll a bowl a roll a bowl a ball? Roll a bowl a roll a bowl a ball. Here you are, here you are, my lucky lad. Penny a side, penny a side. Now then, lady, you try your luck. My good man, how much do you require for one coconut? One copper, lady. One sixth of a tenner. Oh, how terribly, terribly vulgar. Penny a side, penny a side. What about you, dearie? Well, can me little boy have a free fro? Free fro? Knock it, knock it. No free fro's around here. Here, young'un, where's your penny? I swallowed it. Well, you all be more careful, ain't you? Never heard of lend I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. There they are, standing in the row. Big ones, small ones. Some as big as your head. Give them a twist, a flick of the wrist. That's what a showman said. Oh, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Every ball you go will make me rich. Me husband's over there. They all just love the fair. Sing and roll a bell, a ball, a penny a bit. A bit, a bit. Sing and roll a bell, a ball, a penny a bit. Sing and roll a bell, a ball, a penny a bit. Roll a bell, a ball. Roll a bell, a ball. Sing and roll a bell. Roll a bowl a ball a penny a lovely bunch of coconuts. Roll a bowl a ball a penny a lovely bunch of coconuts. Roll a bowl a ball a penny a nah. coconut. Splendid, splendid. Uh, here, I mean here, my last. Here is the gold coin for thee. Nay, nay, Your Majesty. Tis not gold I seek, but aid from your noble knights. Well, buckle my doublet and rivet me breeches. <laughs> yon ragged wench talks like a lady. I am Princess June. My sister May has been held prisoner since last February by the Black Knight, Sir August. <gasps> Looks like Sir August stole a march on us. <laughs> He thinks I sound like Sir Milton of Burl. <laughs> it was to escape us from the clutches of the Black Knight that I disguised myself in this cheap $500 copy of an Adrian dress. <laughs> well, Jerry, thou art a lovely vision withal. I, Sir Lancelot, bow low before thee. Oh, methinks I bowed a little too low. <laughs> You should be careful, Lancelot. You've dented your pants a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Fear not, my princess. I shall go forth and rescue thy sister from the cowardly black knight. Wait. Before thou takest thy leave, thou must consult the royal wizard. Merlin! Merlin! Wait, you. Oh, yes. What sayest thou? Perform thy magic. Oh, yes, your majesty. <clears throat> Uh, take us our card from this deck. Any card. Tell us me not what it is. No, no, no. <laughs> no Merlin, no. Look it now into the future that we may know the perils that await Sir Lancelot. Oh. Abracadabra. Hocus, pocus. Presto, change your metro. Now, get to, get to the trick. <laughs> Sir Lancelot, I see you and the princess coming to a wide river. Hocus, pocus. I see a river too deep to ford, too perilous to swim, and you have no boats. Then how do we get across? You use the bridge. <laughs> the guy doesn't know his hocus from his focus. Now you meet a giant and tilt with him in the darkness. That's impossible. When I tilt, I always light up. <laughs> Come, my princess. We will saddle my noble steed and hire us hence. Good. We will need it for an early start because hence is 20 miles away. Yeah. Sir Lancelot, this ride get us uncomfortable. Methinks our steeds grow weary. Thou art so right, Princess. I will trade them in for fresh ones. Where is? Oh, there is the uh, Madman Merlin's used horse lot. <laughs> Merlin? I thought if he was a magician. Aye, he was, but things have been roughest on magicians since Vaudeville died. <laughs> Welcome, Sir Lancelot and Damsel Fair. May I help with thee? Forsooth, we wanted a horse. For eating or for riding? <laughs> Forsooth. <laughs> Odds bodikins, I have just the thing for thee. This horse over here is practically brand new. He has very low mileage. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's not bad, Sir Lancelot. Look at those white sidewall feet. Mm. <laughs> well, he was owned by an old lady in Pasadena. <laughs> She just used him to go shopping. <laughs> he was up with on blocks for six months. Is he... Is he four-gated? No, four-legged. One in each corner. <laughs> Verily, he is a bargain and can be financed through the Bank of Camelot. And pay a 12% interest? Nay, Violet, I will give us the cash. What about accessories? Teeth are extra, you know. <laughs> He needeth not teeth. All he eats is hay, and he can gum that. Yes. Here is the money, madman. Come, princess. We must get to the black night and head it for the blackout. <laughs> we are nearing the castle where my sister is imprisoned. Look, here cometh the black knight. Loose thy lance and lance lunge. Fear, fear not, my beloved. I shall cut through his armor with ease, for on the end of my lance I have a can opener. <laughs> on guard, varlet, cometh to joust with thee, I do. Oh, splendid Sir Lancelot, you have unseated the black knight. And now throw back his visor and look upon his evil face. <laughs> Who is it? Greetings, friends. Oh. <laughs> uh, in the future, friends, uh, will you please knock before you come in? How, villain, what hast thou to say before I cut it off thy head? Goodbye, aye, aye. Lancelot, my darling, now that thou hast conquered the black knight, uh -huh. I will love thee forevermore. Put that arm all around me. Oh, my fair one, nothing but nothing can come between us. Don't be too sure about that. Huh? Art thou a messenger from Camelot? No, Miss Allison, I'm a messenger from your movie lot. You got a six o'clock call in the morning. Oh, no. Good night, princess. Good night, night. <laughs> Oh, 
Edgar Bergen will be back in a moment. But in the meanwhile, remember, folks, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. An ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. And now, here's Edgar Bergen. Uh, just a word of thanks to June Allison for appearing with us tonight. I guess next week will be the cowboy king of radio and television. Hop along, Cassidy. Good night, everybody. June Allison appeared by arrangement with Metro Golden Mayor, producers of Adam's Rib, starring Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, and June Holiday. To Bill Baldwin speaking for the famous Pasadena Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.